Hallo. Hallo. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, we will uh, wait for some time, and uh, some participants may be joining soon. क्लियर है मैं ना वो फ्लैश मेल भेज रहा हूँ सबको जितने पार्टिसिपेंट है ना मैंने लिखा अब प्रोफेसर ना हेलो आई जस्ट वांट टू नो वेदर आई एम ऑडिबल यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल सर ओके ओके ग्रेट ग्रेट एंड जस्ट इफ आई कैन सी हाउ द फाइल इज टू बी शेयर सो दिस इज द फाइल So, can you uh, kindly tell me how to share this file with all the participants? Uh, sure, sir. Uh, Dr. Rajan, uh, I request you to kindly assist the uh, expert. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, the entire entire desktop is fine. Yeah, entire desktop. Okay, so. Okay, uh, let me just try this. Okay, now, uh, okay, is the of uh, is the PowerPoint file seen by all the participants? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, and I am also yes, audible, I guess. Okay. Yes, sir, it is seen. Okay, fine. So then, in that case, we'll start the lecture in about uh, seven minutes from now. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, yeah. Thanks a lot, Pune. Thanks, thanks for this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>
Uh, good morning, everybody. So, can we uh, begin the uh, the presentation? Uh, uh, sure, sir. Uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Rajan to uh, start the today's session. Hello, uh, Dr. Rajan, I am audible. Yes, yes. Please. Uh, very good morning to all of you. I, Dr. Rajan, on the behalf of Mechanical Engineering, welcome one and all to the last day of the online STC. The distinguished expert for today's session is Professor Shripat P. Moholikar, Professor HAG, Department of Aerospace Engineering, IIT Bombay. Professor Moholikar will deliver a special lecture on introduction to aircraft stealth technology. I hope this lecture will be eye-opening for everyone interested in stealth technology. Dear, dear sir, I welcome you once again. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rajan, for the introduction. So, uh, in fact, I uh, requested uh, uh, Dr. Rajan not to spend too much time in my introduction. Uh, some of the information is easily available from the net. But I would like to introduce myself as working in Department of Aerospace Engineering, still trying to study uh, this research area of, on aircraft stealth technology, in which I try to work on uh, passive uh, infrared signatures, IR stealth. And uh, what I'm really proud is that I had the opportunity to uh, guide the PhD of one of my most illustrious PhD graduates, that is Dr. Rajan Kumar, who is now faculty in NIT Jalandhar. So it was a really proud moment for me to be his external guide when I was on a three semesters deputation at IIT Mandi. So uh, with this brief introduction of myself, I now begin this uh, presentation on aircraft stealth technology. <clears throat> So to begin with, what I would like to clarify is that uh, in this uh, lecture, I would like to focus more on giving an academic insight into this subject because some of the information uh, being in academics, I may not be having all the information. So uh, if there are any Air Force officers or DRDO scient or defense scientists who are uh, uh, participants, then they may be actually having much more information than me. And uh, if there is any information uh, any participant would like to share while I'm giving the lecture, then I request the participant to uh, feel free to uh, share the information. <clears throat> and the second request which I have is that uh, I prefer that this uh, lecture should be in an interaction mode and not in a sermon, that is a one-sided mode 
uh, in which i would like to just talk so it would be very interesting if let us say you know if the participants find that whatever i'm saying if it is uh, ambiguous or it is not clear or you know maybe even if somebody feels it is not correct you know uh, please feel free to immediately stop me and let me know where i'm going wrong and where you know uh, some something is missing okay so with that uh, okay a brief uh, the saying uh, uh, prelude maybe i now uh, straight away start with the uh, presentation on uh, aircraft stealth technology which is actually a full semester course uh, in the department of uh, aerospace engineering okay so in fact a uh, uh, department of aerospace engineering at iit bombay is one of the very few uh, institutes in the country to have uh, this as a full semester course uh, uh, perhaps one of the very few in the country okay so let us begin now so the idea of a uh, stealth technology the idea of incorporation of uh, stealth features is in fact quite uh, age old it is uh, very well known ever since the uh, in history that uh, even for example you know we take even the uh, classical example of a uh, of a hunter okay a hunter wanting to attack its prey in a, in a forest uh, or to capture a, a prey the hunter will follow the uh, principles of stealth technology that is the hunter will try to you know uh, maybe walk slowly so that the his sound uh, is not heard the hunter will try to maybe hide behind the bush uh, behind the trees so the idea is that he should not be seen so these are actually the very well known principles of stealth technology but it took uh, experience in the warfare to realize that this uh, basic principles of stealth which have been used for several uh, years several centuries maybe in operation these basic principles of stealth technology should also be incorporated at the design stage itself so that is the aim of stealth technology that is how to address uh, stealth issues at the uh, design stage itself and how to incorporate the basic principles of stealth in operation <clears throat> now the aim of stealth is to reduce the visibility of aircraft ships uh, submarines satellites ground vehicles including trucks including the military personnel uh, if you see the a uniform of the uh, soldiers so the uniform of the soldiers also if you can see there are some plants on the uniform so the idea is basically to match the uniform with the background so that uh, the soldier is not seen okay so here i may just clarify this visibility over here is not just to the eyes but also to other means of detection which may be even more sensitive than the eyes okay like what we will be slowly covering the radar uh, the infrared as an example okay. so uh, since uh, uh, i am in the aerospace department so my focus will be on aircraft stealth technology and uh, an aircraft gives uh, indication of its presence by uh, several or some of these signatures like for example the acoustic visual the smoke is part of visual uh, and smoke can also give rise to infrared uh, radar and the contrail contrail is actually the uh, weight which the aircraft leaves okay. so this is just a brief introduction to uh, stealth technology and the aim of stealth technology uh, aircraft stealth technology is to achieve air superiority and to convert air superiority into air uh, supremacy Uh, which leads to successful air combat uh, in uh, tactical missions in which there is one to one uh, combat and also in strategic missions like including for example to destroy some vital enemy targets so, so it the air superiority is the application of force to selected series of vital targets which uh, also includes key manufacturing systems sources of raw material critical material stock piles electrical power systems and it is aimed at progressive destruction and disintegration of the opposite sides war making capability until surrender <clears throat> so as you can see that uh, from uh, this particular point that is the air superiority that the aim is to have a surgically clean operation so surgically clean clean operation would mean that the damage to civilians is 
minimize if as far as possible negligible or almost zero and that is the reason why all these so, uh, points like key manufacturing systems and electrical power systems are uh, are uh, are aimed at and when any or all of these are uh, targeted and uh, destroyed then the opposite sides war making capa capability significantly reduces that is a very brief introduction to uh, stealth technology and what is the basic aim of stealth technology so any query on this slide okay so if yeah if not uh, then i'll go to the next slide we can continue sir yeah so we'll go to the so the <clears throat> practical importance uh, of stealth that means when it was practically proven so it was mainly in the gulf war so it was the defining horizon the gulf war sometime in the nine, early 1990s it proved the importance of stealth so it was a uh, uh, seen in the gulf war that the stealth planes which are capable of uh, dropping bombs can now fly invisibly into the opposite sides air space it can drop the payload and fly back without being detected so in the gulf war it was practically demonstrated that stealth aircraft it was mainly the f117a and the b2 capable of dropping bombs can fly invisibly into enemy air space drop the payload and fly back out without being detected <clears throat> so this is the reference for this information so thereafter and even uh, earlier also but especially after the gulf war there has been progress in the development of air superiority fighters with stealth capability and uavs unmanned aerial vehicles also they also need to be uh, stealthy even though they may be unmanned <coughs> so uavs unmanned aerial vehicles uh, there is no uh, human pilot but they need to be stealthy in fact uh, even one shot operations even missiles missiles also need to be stealthy now even though missiles are meant for a uh, one shot operation <coughs> so definitely uavs and of course air security fighters piloted by uh, a human also needs to be uh, stealthy <coughs> so uh, before we go into some of the uh, technical and academic insights let us now first see the general points so these air superiority fighters are aircraft which are intended to gain air supremacy in war by entering and seizing control of enemy air space for complete dominance of air power so air superiority fighters are aircraft intended to gain air supremacy in war as we have discussed earlier the aim of stealth is to transform air superiority to air supremacy by entering and seizing control of the opposite sides air space for complete dominance of air power and air superiority fighters are designed to effectively engage the opposite sides fighters and by now it is very clear that almost all the uh, military aircraft the current generation and the upcoming generations the design would imply stealth design is one of the most and the foremost consideration <clears throat> so <clears throat> which is the current generation of air superiority fighters so if you can just verify this information the current generation is called the fifth generation right the fifth generation uh, air, uh, aircraft they for the current fifth generation aircraft stealth con considerations are one of the foremost <laughs> now the other aim of uh, stealth is that also the precision guided bombs and precision guided missiles which are launched from stealth aircraft make stealth more significant for the launch platform because aircraft are launch platforms for precision guided bombs and and uh, missiles precision guided missiles so what it means is that the effectiveness of precision guided bombs and precision guided missiles is even more when they are launched from stealth platform which is the aircraft 
A precision weapon can be aimed and directed against single target relying on external guided or its own guide system. Precision weapon is aimed and directed against a single target relying either on external guidance or its own guidance system. This own guidance system is generally when the missile is passively guided because if it is semi-actively guided then there has to be some dependence on external guidance. So because this is coming in the way, I just uh, thought I will come out of the screen. So, yeah. so modern precision weapons, they combine attributes of accuracy, range, striking power and portability. So the modern precision weapons, they combine attributes of accuracy, range, striking power and portability. And one example is the use of the surface-to-air missile, which are known as man pads. That is the man-portable air defense systems. They are very cheap, portable, and they are shoulder-fired. And now these uh, missiles, the man pads, they are also uh, available not just with nations, but also with smaller groups. Fine. So this is the reference. So just a quick look at these, uh, this is a, uh, uh, in fact, a, a sketch of a UAV and uh, how stealth features are incorporated. UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, also called drone. So it is an aircraft without human pilot on board and the flight is controlled autonomously by computers in the vehicle or under remote control of pilot on ground or in another vehicle. So. In a UAV, flight is controlled autonomously by computers in vehicle or under remote control of pilot on ground or in another vehicle. And this is uh, to illustrate how stealth feature is incorporated in a UAV. So what you can see over here is a S-shaped intake and uh, the, an S-shaped nozzle for the exhaust flow. So the aim of S shape is actually to hide the internal parts of the engine. And the same is true with S shaped nozzle. The aim of an S shaped nozzle is uh, to hide the uh, internal parts uh, as seen from the rear side. And S shaped intake, the aim is to hide the internal parts of the engine from the front side. So we'll, maybe if time permits, I'll try to clarify which of the two sides, front side or the rear side, which of the two is more important. So, and because this is basically a CFD uh, core, so what I wish to mention that modeling air flows in S-shaped intake and S-shaped nozzle is in fact quite challenging because S-shaped intakes and S-shaped nozzles are required from point of view of stealth. But at the same time, there is bound to be some amount of uh, pressure loss because of the, for example, due to curvature and it, uh, we need to arrive at a design which to try to manage the pressure loss resulting from the bend in the flow, whether it is the intake or whether it is the exhaust, the pressure loss, uh, we should try to manage with it. But at the same time, because health needs to be given priority, we need to live and manage with the pressure loss in order to arrive at stealth features, that is hiding the inside part of the engine, the engine from the front side and from the rear side, which is especially important from point of view of radar. It is also important from point of view of the thermal infrared signature. Right. So, any questions so far? So, if not, then I will go to the next slide. Now, again, uh, before we enter into the, uh, uh, the technical scientific aspects of STEL, we need to first introduce. So to begin with, we have been discussing about air power. Now it is known in uh, that the current warfare, the use of air power is going to be the most important. In fact, 
more than actually uh, the uh, actual percentage may be close to 80 but definitely more than 50 60% of a war is won by proper use of air power and if air power use is effective then the role of the ground troops is quite limited and generally the role of the ground troops is uh, most of the times is towards the end that is seizing control of the land that is the reason why even aviation aviation and army has become very important army aviation is of course it is well known it is uh, a separate wing of the of the army so so air power is basically the use in offensive role and not just defensive because the objective of any uh, uh, warfare is basically offense and if at all that is any defense is to make sure that the offense is better so air power is in let us now discuss some points in air power and first point aerial warfare so air power is that is aerial warfare is use of military aircraft and other flying machines in warfare to further national interests which also includes military airlift of cargo aerial warfare is the use of military aircraft and other flying machines in warfare to further national interest now why it is mentioned military airlift of cargo that even these aircraft which are actually meant for airlifting of cargo they also need to have these stealth features air power has two roles strategic and tactical strategic is example is bombing of enemy opposite side resources which is achieved by bombers and tactical that is battle for control of airspace which is achieved by fighters <clears throat> so strategic air power is bombing of the opposite side resources using bombers tactical air power is the battle for control of airspace which is achieved by fighters now both bomber aircraft and fighter aircraft both need to be stealthy so there are stealth bombers there are stealth fighters it is a different thing that's many of the stealth fighters can also be used as stealth bombers but many a times stealth bombers may not have the ability to uh, to serve as stealth fighters uh, while dual role is possible yeah. now it so happens if we take a look at the uh, history that the first instance of air power that is the use of air in a warfare was in world war 1 So in World War One, that may be sometime in the uh, early uh, part of the nineteenth uh, century, or maybe yeah, twentieth uh, century. That is nineteen something, nineteen. I, I can't remember. Maybe nineteen ten plus uh, was the World War One. If that was the time when first instance of air power was uh, shown, and the use of it was not much of aircraft but airships. So airships. Uh, are basically uh, lighter than air and aircraft are heavier than air so the use of airships in aerial bombings that is uh, the german zeppelins uh, so for reconnaissance and strategic bombing raids over uk in world war 1 so this was the first instance of air power it was not aircraft but airships in aerial bombings in world war 1 the the german zeppelins which are airships for reconnaissance reconnaissance is basically a kind of surveillance you know to check to to monitor to observe and with the objective of giving information okay, that is reconnaissance okay so the airships were used for reconnaissance and strategic bombing raids over uk in ww1 is the first instance of air power <coughs> now thereafter of course uh, aircraft were used in world war 2 and uh, the air power especially in cold war so cold war i think lasted until the uh, split of the erstwhile uh, soviet union so till then uh, in uh, air power the use of the lethal surface to air missiles as i just mentioned in one of the earlier slides the manpacks man portable air defense systems so the use of the lethal surface to air missiles and in fact the cold war if my 
the date is correct it started somewhere around 1960 or so it was uh, uh, it was it started uh, kind of peaking and uh, since then many of the uh, aircraft helicopter were destroyed by very cheap uh, very portable surface to air missiles so in the cold war uh, the way the simple sams destroyed expensive aircraft expensive helicopter actually gave thought that you know there is a need for stealth because if we design aircraft design helicopter for let us say low fuel consumption for uh, and for other uh, high ex- only for excellent aerodynamics uh, based on you know very high end cfd calculations you know it is not enough <clears throat> or not just to say not enough but it is of no use <clears throat> <clears throat> if your uh, aircraft helicopter is designed for uh, you know less fuel uh, consumption and if it is going to be destroyed immediately then what is the use of <clears throat> designing with very expensive cfd <clears throat> just for excellent aerodynamics you know we need to also maybe use cfd or numerical techniques to see how we can design for uh, from point of view of stealth so it was mainly in the cold war that the realization took place that military aircraft military helicopter military unmanned aerial vehicles need to be designed primarily for stealth and then maybe secondarily for excellent aerodynamics for excellent save or maybe to uh, save fuel as an example and this is what gave rise to uh, the program which was uh, was having the code name have blue and this perhaps was one of the first exclusive stealth aircraft uh, f117 which proved its uh, uh, effectiveness especially in the gulf war <clears throat> <Right. clears throat> so any questions so far sir yeah please hi uh, sir my name is bharat yeah, hello yeah uh, sir uh, so i wanted to ask that in the slide you showed that how engine is uh, uh, used in a stealth mode to hide it from the enemy radar i wanted to ask that if uh, only a certain part of the uh, war machine is covered to uh, hide it from the enemy or uh, the whole aircraft is designed in a way uh, well uh, uh, i if i get your uh, question correct then uh, your question is because uh, there was a little bit of uh, breaking of your uh, voice but so if i get your question correct let me try to repeat your question how do we hide the front part of the uh, Uh, engine intake that was a question then the answer is that we also have a air inlet screen we also have a air inlet screen and that uh, is also used in that is used mainly in aircraft i will be coming to that slide very soon so the air inlet screen so it is basically the idea is very simple it is like a wire mesh basically and the spacing between the mesh is actually meant uh, to actually block the uh, radar uh, the transmitted radar wave from entering it but uh, it works for uh, only beyond a certain wavelength if the wavelength is very small then it can penetrate inside the air inlet screen so i'll be coming to that slide that many of these uh, radar stealth features whether it is air inlet screen whether it is radar absorbent material uh, they actually have uh, a limited range of uh, wavelength at uh, wavelength in which they are uh, they will work for okay so firstly uh, let me know if, uh, did i get your question correct and i was asking uh, that uh, if the only engine part is covered for the self uh, uh, or the whole aircraft body is uh, designed in such a, such a way uh, actually the whole aircraft for uh, will be coming to those slides uh, in in the course of this uh, 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 lecture that uh, yes. in fact uh, the whole aircraft that uh, in fact we are going to discuss rcs reduction techniques also so shaping as an example is one technique uh, then we are also going to cover the use of uh, radar absorbent uh, paint radar absorbent materials okay so the whole uh, actually the whole aircraft it is not just the uh, uh, engine okay so engine just it so happens that you know uh, we can get a very good ir signature from a wide range of viewing aspect because what is known as you know these uh, engine Uh, intake and the engine exhaust they actually behave more as uh, like cavities and cavities are known to give a very good radar cross section radar cross section is another term which will be introduced over a wide range of uh, viewing angles and in fact now significant amount of computation is also going into 
estimating the radar cross section now just like cfd computational fluid dynamics computational electromagnetics cem computational electromagnetics is a very important major field in fact for uh, predicting mainly the radar cross section okay so actually the answer to your question is the complete aircraft the complete aircraft needs to be designed so that its radar returns are minimized okay so there are two techniques shaping it has its own limitation the other technique is uh, radar absorbent material uh, which has a certain band wavelength band in which it, it works so this will be very soon covered in the upcoming slides so this is to answer your question immediately uh, is it fair enough yes sir thank you sir okay any other query yeah good morning sir i am shelen kasera so my question is uh, can russia's s400 detect the uh, fighter plane data based on steel technology Uh, okay, your question is: Can uh, can a particular country's uh, detector? Now you are referring to, let us say, a radar uh, detector, as I understand, right? S four hundred, yeah. Okay, firstly, S four hundred. I'm sorry to say, I don't have the information, and in fact, I don't have information to any specific country because, you know, since I'm an academic institution, so all my presentation, firstly, I wanted to clarify, is purely academic. There is no. um uh, there is no uh, you know data of any particular detector no data of any particular aircraft okay so uh, the answer to your question actually i'm sorry to say i don't have the answer that a particular detector can detect a particular aircraft okay so uh, that answer while i don't have but still i would like to make an effort to answer your question in an from an academic perspective okay now uh, what i would like to say now if your question is can a particular radar detector okay detect a particular stealth aircraft okay if that is how i would like to po uh, you know uh, pose a question can a particular radar detector detect a particular stealth aircraft and a particular stealth aircraft has a very low radar cross section okay almost that of a bird okay almost that of a bird then one way what we do now radar i think we will be covering very soon is an active device right radar is an active device so which means it is having a transmitter it is having a receiver so if a particular aircraft uh, appears uh, as a bird then what we do is that you know we are not very sure then you know we will try to will just increase the trans power of the transmitter okay so if we increase the power of the transmitter then on the radar monitor the bleep what is called the bleep the bleep will appear larger okay so that is one advantage these uh, radar detectors have that even for aircraft which have a low radar cross section by increasing the transmitter power we can get some information and then using other techniques you know by other uh, processing we can get information whether that is actually a bird or whether it is actually a stealth aircraft okay so this is uh, i thought i will just give you know a general answer and the specific information i actually i don't have okay so is that fair enough okay thanks sir okay any other query <clears throat> okay if not if there is then yeah but uh, many thanks for the very interesting questions and uh, feel free to uh, ask uh, uh, any question that uh, you may have at uh, any point in the presentation okay right now uh, this slide of, okay we are still discussing the uh, just uh, the immediate past the air power post the cold war air power after the cold war so there has been substantial progress in uh, aircraft stealth in spite of a shrinking uh, military budgets so there has been significant progress in stealth in spite of shrinking military budgets so that shrinking military budgets might have sh shrunk other aspects of uh, military technology but not stealth <laughs> and as we have just discussed earlier that the gulf war uh, has Uh, became the defining uh, event for stealth evolution because it was practically uh, seen that the initial strikes in the gulf war of primarily of f117a stealth bombers with armament of precision laser guided bombs and anti radar missiles okay the the initial strikes composed of f117a stealth bombers with armament of precision laser guided bombs and anti radar missiles and uh, the opposite sides anti aircraft weapons were unable to detect and because they were unable to detect they were they did not have enough time enough reaction time to you know 
engage the uh, F117 and B2 bomber and <clears throat> this is the reason why this is the reason why in gulf war the F117A were only 2 to 3% of the total force of 1900 fighters and bombers but the 2 to 3% of the total force they executed more than 40% of strategic target attacks using laser guided bombs so <clears throat> your the aim is to uh, uh, drive that it was uh, in the immediate past the cold war gave a push to the stealth and even after the cold war there has been significant progress in uh, in aircraft stealth even though the military budgets have been shrinking <clears throat> now i will slowly come into the uh, technical part of cell so but before that so what are the features of a uh, modern uh, warfare so let us try to arrive at the uh, features of a uh, modern warfare so so it is well known by now that uh, maybe something like maybe 3 uh, 4 uh, centuries back so nowadays uh, war is definitely not uh, fought using muscle power so no war today is fought using muscle power at all so uh, there are other uh, features which now will determine success in uh, modern warfare and the deciding factors are mainly speed so high speed aircraft are definitely important but we will try if time permits we will discuss how speed affects uh, uh, maybe uh, the tactics okay. <clears throat> and this is the reason why also in even in military hypersonic uh, vehicle hypersonic aircraft in the future will have a very important role because having high speed is always advantages so that is why supersonic aircraft okay till the time hypersonic aircraft uh, become a reality because sustained hypersonic flight is still a problem so speed in terms of supersonic aircraft now most of the fifth generation aircraft they are not just supersonic but we will try to cover they also have a capability called super cruise capability that that they will be able to uh, cruise at supersonic speeds for a long duration of time <clears throat> uh, we'll uh, see if we can cover that depending upon time but right now speed is important because it brings down the reaction time for the opposite side because bringing down the reaction time for the opposite side is important especially from point of view of surprise so if the opposite side is taken by surprise then uh, it is having a tactical advantage of course surprise would mean non disclosure the opposite of advertising okay, so and speed helps uh, achieving surprise <clears throat> the other deciding fact in modern warfare is initiative initiative is the act of taking charge before the opposite side so even before the <clears throat> opposite side gears up for engaging it is important to act and take control of the opposite side and that is achieved by initiative so of course initiative sometimes information is required also from intelligence okay, yeah. now modern wars as we have just discussed they are highly technical and they use uh, for example electronic warfare ew electronic warfare and hence modern wars are highly unconventional as was seen <clears throat> and even as uh, maybe something like 10 years back uh, even in syria you know they are also modern wars are highly unconventional <clears throat> they use technology so what is electronic warfare though we will try to cover it in slightly more detail later ew electronic warfare it involves the use of the electromagnetic spectrum <clears throat> electronic warfare involves the use of electromagnetic spectrum or directed energy of the electromagnetic spectrum to control the spectrum to attack the opposite side or to obstruct the opposite side as well as using the electromagnetic spectrum this is what the electronic warfare involves <clears throat> electronic warfare involves the use of the electromagnetic spectrum or directed electromagnetic energy to control the electromagnetic spectrum on both the sides to attack the opposite side or to ob obstruct the opposite side as well as using the electromagnetic spectrum and the aim of electronic warfare is to deny the opposite side the advantage of use of electromagnetic spectrum and to ensure a friendly unimpeded access 
two electromagnetic spectrum. This is the aim. The aim of electronic warfare is to deny the opposite side the advantage of the use of electromagnetic spectrum and to ensure friendly unimpeded access to the electromagnetic spectrum. <coughs> <clears throat> and use of electromagnetic spectrum is now an integral part of modern warfare. And as we have also uh, seen in some of the earlier slides, but just to quickly summarize that uh, an important feature of modern warfare is establishment of air superiority of air power, which would mean, as we have discussed earlier, limited role of ground troops, that is the army. The feature of modern warfare is establishment of superiority of air power that is limited role of the army and it is mainly the ground troops mainly so ground troops are part of the army the role is mainly 25 percent of the uh, war is won they, then the army ground troops they seize control so it was not like earlier <clears throat> And uh, use of stealth is now an integral feature of modern warfare. Use of stealth is now an integral feature of modern warfare. So what is stealth? <clears throat> so uh, while, you know, it is, uh, so because the idea is not to uh, uh, discuss too much of jargon, the aim is actually to simplify. So in fact, though a lot of people might, uh, in fact, almost everybody now knows what is stealth aircraft, what is the stealth uh, a uh, ship, a uh, stealth tank, uh, uh, everybody has read, even in newspapers, it is part of, uh, you know, even uh, even school children know uh, what is a stealth aircraft. But anything that, to, it is, uh, that is to do with stealth, if I were to say it in very simple words, anything to do with stealth is covered under only three very simple English words. <laughs> anything to do with stealth is just covered in three words, camouflage, conceal and deceive. Stealth, anything in stealth is covered by camouflage, conceal and deceive. Conceal is hide. Whatever is seen, you try to hide. Try not to show. Try not to advertise. Okay. So whatever you use for hiding, whatever you use for hiding, you have to camouflage. So what is camouflage? Camouflage is merge with the background. <clears throat> so if an aircraft is the same as the background, then the aircraft is not seen as an example. <clears throat> And camouflage and conceal, these two together come under LO. LO is called low observables. Low observables takes care of camouflage and conceal. And deception, uh, to cheat as an example, to cheat the opposite side, it comes, is taken care of largely by electronic warfare. Deception to cheat, to fool the opposite side is largely taken care of by electronic warfare. <laughs> <clears throat> stealth tries to reduce the signatures uh, pattern of signals, whether it is visible, the oral, whether it is radar, whether it is infrared. The stealth tries to reduce the signature of aircraft, ships, tanks, armored vehicles, including trucks. The military trucks also need to reduce their signatures. And use of stealth brings about the capability of evading the opposite side's defense system. So if, uh, if uh, our aircraft are uh, uh, stealth, having stealth features, then the uh, opposite side's uh, defense systems can be evaded. And even if incorporating stealth, there is a cost. So uh, stealth will come at some price. There will be some increase in cost. But that increase in the cost is justified because we will be covering this probability. Stealth will make, will try to ensure that your aircraft, ships, tanks, whatever, military vehicle, its survivability, probability of survival in a man-made hostile environment is high. If you incorporate, if you use CFD to, for stealth design, then the high cost involved in the stealth design is justified because it will make sure that our aircraft helicopter will survive in a man-made hostile environment. <laughs> Any questions so far?
no if not i'll go to the next slide okay so after every two three slides i'll request for questions if you have okay so that you know uh, i was uh, so that it becomes uh, even more interesting if possible okay let's go to the next slide if there are no questions okay <clears throat> now let us uh, uh, quickly you know this actually is available in uh, some standard books but let us we need to go through this combat effectiveness because combat effectiveness is discussed because we need to first see mission assess mission assessment and where stealth fits in mission assessment so mission assessment is assessment of aircraft capabilities and assessment of uh, threat environment so assessment of aircraft capabilities and assessment of threat environment is part of mission assessment and it is uh, addressed by uh, these three parameters mission attainment measure survival rate and measure of mission success <clears throat> now what is the difference between these three mission attainment measure survival rate which should depend on survivability and measure of mission success which combines these two mission attainment measure is the effectiveness is the effectiveness of aircraft in offensive view because as a, a few slides back i tried to uh, state that any warfare the objective is offense okay so so mission attainment measure is the effectiveness of aircraft in offensive view so it is the relative measure of accomplishment of offensive objective in the presence of threats but without considering consequences of threat so it is the relative measure of accomplishment of the offensive objective of the mission which is the primary objective in the presence of threats but without considering the consequences of threats now this will hold stand alone now this mission attainment measure holds stand alone when either the opposite side is uh, is extremely weak so then mission attainment measure stand alone holds or the other way around when we are extremely strong which happens when we are equipped with infinite amount of resources <laughs> now this infinite resources have to be taken with a little bit of pinch of salt because you know we, when we especially try to include the human resources then we need to be a little bit careful <clears throat> so which would mean that even if we might be having infinite amount of uh, other resources but when it comes to human resources like a human pilot then we need to be a little careful when only looking at the mission attainment measure <coughs> now the second <coughs> parameter is the survival rate so survival rate is a function of survivability so it is defined for example if aircraft uh, are carriers of the offensive part of the mission so uh, because uh, in air for air power aircraft are carriers of the offensive part of the mission so survival rate is the number of aircraft returning divided by the number of aircraft launched so survival rate is the number of aircraft returning after completing the offensive part of the mission divided by the number of aircraft that are launched uh, for executing the offensive part of the mission and survival rate is the effectiveness of aircraft in the defensive view that means total consciousness of the threat of the opposite side so survival rate is the effectiveness of aircraft in the uh, defensive perspective that is considering total consciousness of the threat posed by the opposite side and then we try to combine these two by taking the product of these two the survival rate and mission attainment measure it is the measure of mission success so it is a relative measure of aircraft's overall success in mission measure of mission success product of mission attainment measure and survival rate is measure of mission success relative measure of aircraft's overall success in mission so how it can be used is so then we need to find how many aircraft need to be launched so to find how many aircraft need to be launched then we have a mission goal so mission goal divided by the measure of mission success gives an indicator of the number of aircraft be launched which is the denominator of the survival rate so if we 
Yeah, please, please, go ahead. Yeah. Someone else is presenting. Your screen is not visible. Sorry, screen is not visible. Uh, uh, so okay, okay. Just let me try once again. Now is it visible? Uh, excuse me, sir. Actually, yeah. Harz Gulati is uh, by mistakenly. I think he is presenting. Uh, okay. He need to come out, and now you are your screen is visible. Or you you are now you are visible. Okay, okay. So uh, maybe then I'll just request. So somebody else is presenting. If you can kindly not share, so that yeah. Now is this presentation seen? Uh, you are visible. Sir, Your presentation. Actually visible, sir. So now you have to start presenting. Sir, actually you have to start your presentation again. Uh, okay, so let's have uh, started uh, presenting. Half uh, bulate. Uh, you are requested. Please do not interrupt the lecture. Huh? Okay, actually, I'm not familiar with this Google, but I'll just try to find out from my the system administrator of my department. Just give me a moment. I'll try to figure out how to you now share. Just give me a moment. Uh, we can help you, sir. You will find uh, uh, one minute in the bar. You will find presenter now. Just give me a moment. Okay. Uh, okay. Where is that uh, share option? Uh, if you can kindly help me, otherwise I have to call uh, uh, one of my friends in the department. Oh, so you will find one. Sir, excuse bar. me. Uh, yeah. I will help you. Uh, just uh, click on present now in the bottom uh, bar. You can see present now. There is a stop sharing. Hide is there. Just just a minute. Sir, first do a stop sharing and then I start presenting again. Just one minute. Uh, let me try to figure out. Yes, sir. There is now the on your desktop. There is a blue option of stop sharing. Yeah, I shall I click stop sharing? Okay, fine. Yes. fine. So now uh, you have to present again by clicking on present now. Uh, present now option is not there. One minute. Ah, Let ah, me okay, okay. Okay. Present, now. present now. Your entire screen, a window of Chrome. Why say entire screen? So, which, which, uh, your PPT window. Select your PPT window. That will be present. No, let it be entire screen because sometimes entire screen, sir. Click on so, entire screen. And you have and, to uh, on PPT. screen make visible your PPT after that. Okay. Now okay, click not entire screen. And then share, yes, sir. You want to yes, no. yeah, yes. It's okay. Perfectly okay. fine, sir. Okay, now it is seen, I guess, right? So no problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I will request you to kindly click on the slideshow. Slideshow more, slideshow. Okay. Fine. Yes, fine. Sir. Okay. Perfectly fine, sir. We can continue. Okay, fine. <clears throat> Okay, so sorry for the interruption. Actually, I'm not very familiar with this Google because I use some other software. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Software is not important. But let us see. go back to the content. Okay, so we were discussing this measure of mission success, which integrates the offensive and the defensive part. So uh, the measure of mission success is a product of uh, the offensive part, mission attainment measure, defensive part, survival rate. And uh, your this is the some kind of a, a, a executive summary of what I want to tell uh, in this slide is that uh, having a high survival rate is important uh, uh, because even though the offensive part may come uh, come down, and even if we assume that the product measure of mission success comes down, but the number of aircraft that need to be launched that is the denominator here the number of aircraft need to be launched even if let us say they are high. To achieve a particular mission goal, but the most important, as we discussed, including the uh, possible human uh, involvement uh, in uh, achieving the offensive part, then the loss, which is one minus s times the number of aircraft launched, the reducing this is extremely important. So I, I think I don't have, I, I don't know whether I should spend a little time as to why this term, one minus s. 1 minus s is the loss, or rather 1 minus s times number of aircraft launched, that is uh, is a loss, and this loss needs to be minimized. And the reason is because, uh, so if there is any participant who is uh, in the Air Force or Defense Lab will can confirm that in a warfare, 
even if an aircraft is partially damaged or partly damaged then the time that is available for repair in a warfare is not enough that the aircraft can be used again within the particular uh, time frame <clears throat> therefore even if a aircraft is partly damaged and if sufficient time is not available for repairing a partly damaged aircraft then the aircraft is as good as not available for the next mission in the warfare and generally the time available uh, in warfare is very short so that is the reason why minimizing the loss is extremely important which is achieved by high survival rate and high survival rate is achieved by high stealth features and high stealth features which is actually appears to be mainly a defensive part but actually helps in the offensive part so this what i am trying to say is that the offensive part of the mission and the defensive part they actually are not mutually exclusive they the offensive and defensive part they are not mutually exclusive they are not orthogonal okay so that is actually the point to be conveyed any questions so far okay if not then go to the next i would like to request to the participant if they have any query they can interact with the professor yeah uh, if yeah is there any question no then i'll go to the next slide okay we, we can continue sir yeah so survivability is the uh, now let us quick take a quick look at the probability survivability is the ability of aircraft to avoid or withstand a man made hostile environment survivability is ability of aircraft to avoid or withstand a man made hostile environment without abortive impairment of ability to accomplish the mission so this is a rider that ability to withstand without abortive impairment of ability to accomplish the offensive part of the mission so survivability is defined as 1 minus probability of kill pk is the probability of kill and probability of kill is the product of a uh, susceptibility ph is the susceptibility it is the inability of aircraft to avoid being detected and hit so ph susceptibility is the probability of hit and uh, pk by h is the conditional probability that aircraft is killed which is given given a hit pk by h the conditional probability that aircraft is killed given a hit is called vulnerability so these two are different probabilities product of these two probabilities is the probability of kill and one minus probability of kill is the survivability <laughs> so stealth tries to reduce the probability of hit stealth features will aim at reducing the probability of hit if probability of hit is reduced then probability of kill is reduced if probability of kill is reduced then survivability is improved <coughs> so uh, so we can also discuss vulnerability but i think since time is short uh, vulnerability enhancement is also important uh, achieved by having redundant features or shielding mission critical components so if i were to just briefly touch upon how do we <clears throat> try to reduce the vulnerability of an aircraft which would mean an aircraft is hit but at the same time it can continue with its mission then there are certain we need to identify certain mission critical components in an aircraft so some of the mission critical components of an aircraft so one of them uh, i can name is a control surface so that is and for example in a helicopter so any participant would like to help me which is one of the most uh, vulnerable parts of a, a helicopter so if anybody is there uh, working on helicopters will confirm that the tail rotor the tail rotor is one of the most uh, vulnerable parts of a helicopter if the tail rotor is damaged then the helicopter is almost uh, not available <coughs> so as an example so uh we need to identify the uh, mission critical components and either shield them or provide redundancy that even if one fails then the other is available <coughs> now stealth aims at uh, minimizing the susceptibility probability of hit probability of hit is the product of the following three uh, probabilities probability that the threat is uh, active probability of detection identification and tracking and probability that the threat propagator is launched 
the threat propagator is guided and after a guidance it reaches close to the target then it is detonated so susceptibility is the product of these three probabilities probability that the threat is active pa so this information is achieved mainly by intelligence probability of detection of the target probability of identifying the target whether the target is a friend or foe i think uh, some incidences which have taken place in the past one or two years it is not just important to identify and a flying aircraft it is also very important to identify whether the flying aircraft or flying helicopter whether it is a friend or foe this is also very important so this will you know uh, avoid some uh, issues like we do not destroy our own aircraft our own helicopter this is also very important so without going into details it is known that identification is important and uh, probability of tracking Tra after identifying then tracking that is uh, taking the threat propagator up to the uh, target then probability of launch probability of uh, guidance and probability of detonation of the actual threat that is it could be a bomb as an example or sometimes in some cases it can even be ballistic that is direct kinetic hit as an example but here we refer uh, the as p d small t that is probability of detonation because most of the surface to air missiles and the air to air missiles they generally have a warhead so there will be a bomb uh, and it detonates within a particular radius which is of the order of few meters from the target aircraft as an example so that is to clarify regarding susceptibility and the aim of stealth is to reduce susceptibility which is achieved by reducing the probability of detection probability of identification probability of tracking probability of launch and probability of guidance so these are the probabilities which will be minimized by incorporating susceptibility reducing stealth features so probability of detection probability of identification and probability of uh, tracking probability of launch of the threat propagator probability of guidance will be the probabilities minimized by using survivability enhancement stealth features and vulnerability is uh, generally not covered under stealth but uh, it is also important to have uh, high uh, re to reduce vulnerability for high survivability and uh, vulnerability is the inability of aircraft to withstand one or more hits by the opposite side's artillery or defense vulnerability is inability of aircraft to withstand one or more hits by the opposite side's artillery or defense okay. so now uh, about to give some information about uh, electronic warfare but before that are there any questions from the participants or anything which i said is ambiguous or not clear please let me know uh hello yes any question uh, i request to uh bhavna joshi uh, you may directly interact with the expert hello yeah any question uh so there is a question in the chat box is yeah. there any situation where effectiveness and accuracy of this technology get affected is there any situation where so the question is is there any situation where effectiveness and accuracy of this technology get affected situation where accuracy of this technology and now the aim of this technology is a particular effect i will i will try to answer it this way the aim of this technology is to achieve a particular effect and one of the effect is accuracy of the offensive part of the mission one of the uh, aim is accuracy of the offensive part of the mission this is where this technology help this is how i would like to clarify uh, from answering i don't know whether it is fair enough is it fair enough or uh, you uh, or you still have a, a question okay, thank you uh, i would like to request all the participants kindly uh, give your brief introduction to the expert before to ask the question Yeah, so we have another uh, participant who would like to interact. 
I request yeah, to Sanjay Raheja, you can interact. Yeah. Any query? Uh, Mr. Sanjay Raheja, uh, would you like to interact? Uh, so I don't think so. There's a, uh, any okay, no question. We can continue the session. Okay, then let's continue. Now let me give a brief introduction uh, to electronic warfare. So electronic uh, warfare is, uh, the aim is uh, deceiving the opposite side's defense system. Electronic warfare, the aim is deceiving the opposite side's defense system. And it has three parts, electronic support measure, electronic countermeasure, and electronic counter countermeasure. So the aim of uh, electronic uh, warfare is deception. And these are the three wings, electronic support measure, it aims at its aim is to intercept and analyze signals and extract the information of the threat. So electronic support measure, one of the aims is to intercept and analyze signals and extract information about the threat. As we just discussed, including whether the uh, whether what we uh, are uh, what these signals are, they belong to a friend or a foe. This is also, of course, an important part. Okay. And to determine appropriate uh, response for countering the threat. <clears throat> and also to determine appropriate response for countering the threat. So examples of electronic support measure are MAWS. MAWS is, stands for Missile Approach Warning System. MAWS is Missile Approach Warning System. And RWR is a Radar Warning Receiver. So almost... All the military aircraft they have on board an RWR. RWR is radar warning receiver. <laughs> so all this is part of electronic support measure. Then comes electronic countermeasures. The aim of electronic countermeasures is to fool or deceive, to cheat the opposite side's detectors. The aim is to uh, fool the opposite side's detectors. So th they, there are two types, active and passive. So in active type, it is deliberate generation of false signals to compete with the actual signals. <laughs> so the aim of active electronic countermeasures is to purposefully generate uh, false, fake signals to compete with the actual signals. And we will be covering this also briefly. Uh, one example is the noise jamming radars. So noise jamming radars. And we will also cover a concept called the burn through range. So burn through range is proportional to a, a square root of the radar cross section. The burn through range we will be covering. So it is a part of uh, understanding of the noise jamming radars. And noise jamming radars are is an example of active electronic countermeasure. Also, electronic decoys. Electronic decoys are also an example of uh, active electronic countermeasure. <laughs> then passive electronic countermeasures include fake reflection of radiated detecting signals. So passive, I'm just uh, for the time being come out of this because this box is coming, you know, uh, blocking. I'll again put it in uh, this uh, presentation mode. So you, can, you, can, you can use the, you can just hit the uh, hide button. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah. I was, I was not knowing. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, the uh, uh, passive electronic countermeasure, uh, uh, they try to achieve fake reflection of radiated detecting signals. Fake reflection of radiated detecting signals. And uh, practical examples include uh, shafts against the radar, hot flares, infrared flares against infrared detectors, and corner reflectors also for radar. So these passive shafts, passive uh, infrared flares, passive corner reflectors, these are all examples of uh, passive electronic countermeasures. And then we have EC squared M, that is electronic counter countermeasures. An example is this flare rejection algorithms. So if time permits will go to imaging uh, detectors and point detectors, if time permits will definitely cover these also. 
so this flare rejection algorithms uh, that is how to identify whether it is a passive electronic countermeasure or is it actually the target so we have this flare rejection algorithms so that is ec squared n <coughs> so it is a different thing we also have ec cubed n but uh, ec cubed n we again come back to ecm so if that is the interesting part of stealth which will try to also summarize that the stealth is dynamic because not just that we have uh, ecm that is we have electronic countermeasures but we also have elect, uh, counter countermeasures which again comes back to ecm so that is what makes the stealth dynamic it is not just like understanding fluid mechanics you know once we know the laws of, of fluid flow the basic laws and we try to model using the navier stokes equation and then we arrive at a geometry which will give rise to let us say the minimum drag and the highest lift for an aircraft then we have achieved the best aerodynamic design so this is not the case with stealth because in stealth what happens is so if you design an aircraft for extremely high aerodynamic high lift and low drag then in that case you know that design can stay for a very long time <clears throat> but in stealth what happens is it is always a competition between our aircraft and the opposite side's detectors so just like we try to make our aircraft stealthy and we try to incorporate stealth features but the opposite side's detectors are also taking care they are becoming more sensitive they are trying to use other techniques to identify uh, whether uh, uh, our whether uh, whether it is an uh, aircraft our aircraft or it is our decoy so because of the dynamic nature we always need to make sure that we are uh, uh, we are at, uh, the, the state of art keeps changing very fast as compared to other conventional disciplines so this is one very exciting aspect of uh, work uh, you know uh, doing research in this area of stealth technology just to try to uh, you know generate some interest in the participants and also if possible to motivate some of them to consider this as a field of research for them okay any questions so far no Sir? yeah any questions? yeah please, yeah, please go ahead I wanted to ask that if uh, there is a fight going between two aircraft in our uh, our airspace, then uh, does this technology help to determine the which one is the friend and which one is the foe? Uh, actually, I will. Yeah. So I will tell you the problem. Yeah, with this uh, 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 this identification of friend and foe. Uh, okay. Uh, let me, uh, uh, just, just, uh, maybe if you can kindly uh, uh, mute so that the background comes down. Okay, thank you very much. So let me try to answer this, though I am having a few slides later to explain this. So uh, what you are uh, saying is absolutely a very genuine question. Identifying friend of fo or foe is important even in the last one or two years. That is very important. I, we should not destroy our own aircraft. We should not destroy our own helicopter even by accident. It is a big, it is a big uh, problem actually. So. So what happens, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, uh, normally if we just try to use a, a detector, which is a point detector, like a bleep, bleep on the monitor, you know, then that bleep can come from a friend, it can come from a foe, that bleep can come also from a bird. Okay, then uh, there are other means of uh, signal processing. There are other means of signal processing, which will try to extract information and then try to converge at whether that uh, bleep or the point or the dot on the monitor, whether it is a friend, whether it is a foe or whether it is a bird. So other means of signal processing are uh, used to arrive at this decision. Now, this is always a problem in point detectors. This is always a problem with point detectors where we just get a bleep on the monitor. Okay, that we need other means of signal processing to extract more information and confirm that uh, uh, what we are seeing is a friend for or, uh, or something which is irrelevant, like a bird, as an example. Okay, so this is where actually this imaging technology, the imaging technology is uh, side by side picking up. And that is the reason why radar imaging and the importance of what I will try to explain in the slides, terahertz range, the terahertz range, which is even higher frequency than the gigahertz range. Okay. So generally in most of the cases, while radar imaging is possible, but then, you know, it needs significant amount of signal processing in almost all the cases, especially the surveillance radar, including the tracking radar, they just give a bleep on the monitor. Okay. But if we get, uh, if we are using an imaging detector, then we get a complete image of the scene. 
we get a complete image of the scene with the aircraft as part of the scene and then it is almost like looking at a video it is almost like looking at a video and then you actually have the inf complete information whether it is a friend foe or it is irrelevant so does this answer your uh, question is it uh, fine yes sir yeah. and uh, i want to ask yeah. if we are right now capable of uh, doing this in india sir with our imaging uh, can you kindly repeat your okay. question Sir, I want. I am saying, sir, uh, right now, India is India capable of doing this radar imaging? So, uh, radar imaging, yeah. Uh, what I know is now most of the most of the IR detectors, current generation, are imaging infrared detectors. So nobody talks about IR. They only talk about IIR, imaging infrared. Uh, radar imaging is also possible, but it needs much higher frequencies. and we will also come to that if we try to use very high frequency radar that is in the gigahertz or in the terahertz range preferably in terahertz range imaging is definitely possible because if the frequency is very large then the wavelength is very small if the wavelength is very small then we can get precise information about the uh, target including the geometry and the shape uh, the orientation of the surface which is part of the shape okay so for that we need a very high frequency radar and preferably in the terahertz range so that is why this terahertz range is also becoming important but uh, all this terahertz gigahertz and even this megahertz range they are all active devices so uh, this high frequency uh, radar is an example of use of active uh, radar for the purpose of imaging so yeah so uh, is it fair enough yes sir thank you so much yeah. any other query Uh, sir i have one question yeah please please yeah uh, sir uh, as you mentioned that uh, for passive example of e square m is flare rejection algorithm so what are the example of e square m for active uh example of ec square m for uh, active that means from point of view of let us say noise jamming radar so actually one uh, well at the moment uh, actually i'm sorry i don't have a very precise ans answer to your question the in fact it is a very valid question what is a example of uh, uh, you know ec squared m for active yes. ecm and one example of active ecm is let us say noise jamming radar now noise jamming radar the burn through range is proportional to the square root of rc but if i were to give an answer I, i'm not sure whether it is completely explaining one example of uh, ec squared m for noise jamming radar is actually to reduce the rcs further uh, okay sir okay, so i don't know whether it is convincing but reducing the rcs further will actually make sure that the burn through range further comes down okay sir yes okay, uh, uh, yeah any other yes, question sir. yes no sir this is only my question i am dr pallavi rastogi okay yeah okay uh, yeah any other question fine then we'll continue yeah so now we'll uh, come to more uh, let us say uh, scientific technical part so aircraft signatures now what are the different types of aircraft signatures so the aircraft signatures can be classified into active and passive so active and passive these are the two major classification so active the best example the most uh, popular example is radar uh, radar is an active device and the sources of uh, radar signature in an aircraft are the airframe airframe includes the wings the fuselage uh, that is uh, the main part of the aircraft in which uh, the uh, let us say the payload can be housed uh, housed uh, that and the engine intake the engine exhaust also the weapons that is why many of the uh, fifth generation stealth aircraft they do not have uh, weapons which are seen from the outside the weapons are generally inside and the canopy also is a, a source of a, a radar signature the canopy is actually inside which the pilots uh, the uh, the human pilot is so these are the sources of radar signature uh, which is an active device now passive signatures include uh, infrared acoustic visual and several others so passive uh, signatures in uh, most popular is infrared uh, so it includes the engine hot parts like the jet nozzle 
the airframe, which which could be the rare part of the fuselage. Fuselage is the main body of the aircraft. So the rare part of the fuselage and most of the military aircraft, the engine is embedded inside the fuselage. In uh, most uh, military aircraft, the engine is embedded inside the fuselage and uh, the fuselage, especially the rare part, can be heated by the engine. It can be heated also by skin friction heating, especially at supersonic speeds. Then the engine exhaust gases, the engine exhaust plume is also a very popular source of infrared signature. And uh, also the reflection of the external sources have become very important, also become important sources of infrared signature. So the reflection of the sunshine, earth shine and the sky shine. So the reflection of external sources, sunshine, sky shine, earth shine are also sources of infrared signature. And the best part of this uh, uh, detection of uh, reflection of these external sources, it is not necessary that any of these parts, whether it is the engine or the airframe, it is not necessarily that they should be hot, whether they are hot or whether they are no, not hot. So long as that they have a reflectivity, the external sources reflection become important. <clears throat> the other sources of passive aircraft signatures are uh, like acoustic, what we hear, the engine parts, the engine exhaust, the airframe, because the airframe, there is a flow over the wings and the flow over the wings, uh, we have vortices and the vortices are responsible for generating sound, as an example. The engine exhaust generates sounds, the engine parts, they generate sounds also because of vibration of the engine parts, what is called vibroacoustics. So these are all sound generation acoustic signature, which is the passive. And then the visual, what we see with the eyes also, the airframe, the wings, the engine exhaust and the glow of the engine exhaust. So glow is because of particles like carbon particles in the engine exhaust. So they glow <clears throat> and the glow can be seen by the eyes also. So that is part of visual, what we see, it's a passive. Then the canopy, the canopy inside which the pilot is. And canopy is actually transparent uh, to, or rather semi-transparent to be more precise, even to the visible part. But then there is a glint. The glint is during the, the daytime, the reflection of the sun. The reflection of the sun, that is the glint from the canopy is responsible for passive visual signature. And also the aircraft lighting, the aircraft lighting is especially visible at night time and that becomes a prominent source of visual aircraft signature. <clears throat> and there are several other, now the navigational radar, now navigational radar is actually used for getting information for navigation, it can also be used and most of the aircraft, even many of the military aircraft, they have an onboard radar. <clears throat> Now this onboard radar will also have an antenna and the transmitted beam and the antenna become sources now actually of passive aircraft signature. Though a radar is an active device, but an onboard radar and the onboard radar transmitter and the onboard radar antenna, they become passive sources of aircraft signature. Then any communication that the aircraft is sending either to the ground station or to the other uh, friendly aircraft, that communication can become a part of aircraft's passive signature. And many times the countermeasures which they which do not work. So as we discussed in this slide that the countermeasures are meant to fool or to cheat the opposite side. But if this countermeasures fail, if the countermeasures fail to fool or cheat the opposite side detectors, then these countermeasures become a passive source of aircraft signature. And uh, in fact, it's many times what will happen if you are not uh, uh, taking care of the dynamic part of stealth technology, which means the detectors have already become advanced. And if you are still using the previous generation countermeasures, then these previous generation countermeasures will fail. And instead of fooling the opposite side detector, they will give information about the aircraft. So we need to be careful. <clears throat> so that is the classification, active, passive. <clears throat> Okay, active, we need to do something. So radar, it sends the transmitted beam and the reflected beam gets uh, is used to give information about the aircraft. In the case of uh, passive, the, uh, the, uh, we, don't, we don't need to give, uh, the, uh, give away any information. We don't need to do anything. We just 
passively observe and get information about the aircraft using these uh, signatures infrared acoustic visual and several others so any query so far uh, is sir uh, is there any role of satellites in uh, creating the aircraft signatures or radar sir Oh uh, yes, uh, satellites also uh, can give information. Yes, that is also uh, uh, true. Satellites can also give uh, information about the aircraft, but generally, uh, it also uh, to uh, the most of the information about the aircraft is, or uh, that is especially approaching aircraft is given using surveillance radars, and surveillance radars are uh, ground based. Okay. Most of the cases, the information about. Uh, approaching aircraft is using surveillance radar and most of the surveillance radar are ground based while satellites also can be used for giving information yeah fine is that is that okay yeah thanks sir yeah any other query yeah so if no query then we'll maybe uh, go to the next slide on uh, stealth classification based on signatures so as we have just discussed and also have tried to explain active signatures example radar so the opposite side illuminates the target and the reflected uh, signals give the necessary information in the case of uh, active uh, signatures like in radar the opposite side illuminates the target aircraft and reflection of the signal from the target aircraft is used for extracting the necessary information and the frequency can range from a few hundred hertz or even more in entering into the gigahertz and even the terahertz range so the frequency range is from few hundred hertz uh, entering the gigahertz and including the terahertz range <clears throat> now the radars can be classified so based on their frequency low frequency that is high wavelength so if wavelength is large accuracy comes down but attenuation in the atmosphere is less and that is how we get higher range <coughs> and it is just the other way around if the frequency is large that means wavelength is short accuracy is high but the atmospheric attenuation is large and the range comes down and uh, examples of uh, passive signatures the most common is infrared so aircraft radiate signals over a large frequency range uh, in the infrared region so uh, as an example and uh, uh, examples of uh, other examples of passive include audio waves also radio waves as we have seen over here navigational radar as an example on board radar and radiation in infrared and radiation in visible spectrum and uh, signals emitted reflection of radiation received from natural sources <clears throat> what we discuss for example in the case of infrared sunshine sky shine earth shine and examples also include passive radar passive radar would mean that we have a for example even a bbc transmitting uh, station as an example and it is sending anyway the radio waves from let us say for uh, maybe for some other purpose and they are incident on uh, our on let us say the target aircraft and the reflection from such radio waves is actually called passive radar <coughs> now using the passive signatures is tactically advantageous as compared to active signatures because uh, when we use passive signatures then the target is unaware of being detected whereas the moment we illuminate the target aircraft using let us say a radar the immediately the target aircraft is aware of being detected so it is tactically advantageous to use passive signatures because it gives rise to covert and stealthy detection rather than uh, detect detection in which the opposite the aircraft anyway knows immediately knows that the that the aircraft is being detected so using passive signatures is tactically advantageous but for several years that is even something like 20 30 years back radars are still being used popular uh, are still popular and ir for example was at least not popular uh, until the last 15 20 years 
the main reason is because the radar detection ranges are much larger <laughs> several hundreds of kilometers also and one advantage of being active is that uh, if let us say you are not getting sufficient return signal you can always increase the power of the transmitter to get more information <clears throat> that advantage is not there in passive so till about something like 20 25 30 years back the ir detectors were having a range of hardly 5 or 10 kilometers and radar detection ranges were well above 100 kilometers <clears throat> but with advancements in the ir detector technology that means the sensitivity of ir detectors have gone up today the modern generation ir detectors they have ir detection ranges comparable to radar detection ranges which means of the order of 100 kilometers or even somewhat higher than 100 kilometers also are the typical passive ir detection ranges possible that is the reason why though not a complete re replacement but ir detectors are also used as infrared search and track even before ground based surveillance and irst is also used on board an aircraft what is known as for example forward looking infrared okay so the other advantage of using radar is ranging that is getting information about the distance is very convenient because it is just the difference between the time of the transmitted and the return signal whereas passive ranging is much more difficult than active ranging that is to get information about the distance because for passive ranging we always need a reference and it is not as accurate as active ranging so that is the reason why radars are still popular and being used mainly because of their high radar detection range, range and also because uh, of the convenience of radar ranging okay yeah so any questions so far Uh, any parts that would like to interject? Okay, if not, what I suggest is uh, we'll take a short uh, five to uh, seven minutes break, and we will uh, reassemble uh, after the break. And even after the break, if you have, uh, let me know if if you have any question before I go to the next slide. Okay, so we'll take a short five to seven minutes break. Okay, is that fine? Sure, sir. Sure. Yeah, okay. Fine. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. 
Okay, so I guess uh, most of the participants have they returned back from the break. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, even uh, more participants have joined also. Okay, so then we can continue. Sure, sir. Sure. Okay. Great. Okay. So before I continue uh, on this active yes. nature, uh, radar, radio detection, and ranging, uh, can. Uh, are there any queries based on uh, what was uh, covered before the break? Okay, if there are no queries, yeah. any queries? Sir? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, I wish to add one thing. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, we were talking about sensitivity of IIR detector. So, sensitivity of IIR detector have increased first by enhancing IR imaging cap capability through multicolor IR detection and uh, this making IR CM ineffective. And second point is by increasing lock on range. Uh, yes, yes, that is uh, absolutely uh, the point. Uh, so uh, from point of view of IR detectors, so if you use an imaging IR detector then the imaging IR detector will be immediately able to identify whether it is a flare or whether it is a target. So, And sir, so this uh, multicolor IR detection is using uh, by using QWIP technology. Yes, sir. So uh, that is, I think, most probably a part of this uh, EC squared M. What you said is absolutely uh, uh, fine. Because EC squared M, the use of multicolor uh, technology will enable better imaging capability, and then it can better identify, for example, friend, foe, or it can identify between. Uh, for example, between uh, uh, whether it is uh, the target aircraft or whether it is the yes, flag. So all that will be much using uh, multicolor 
imaging infrared detector i completely agree yes, yes. Okay. Okay. and also the sensitivity of conox for the lock on range and the detection ranges have are now uh, of the order of 100 kilometers so because of the sensitivity uh, increasing yes yes sir yes sir yeah any other point you would like to add uh, no sir Okay. I would like to uh, request to the participants please uh, give you a brief introduction to the professor first uh, to ask the question. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Kajal, I think uh, you would like to interact. Yeah, please Kajal, go. Ahead. Hi. Yes. Uh, so I uh, I'm Kajal. Uh, sir, I have a question on that uh, that uh, passive radar and active radar. They have same range or uh, there is a range difference in both of them. Uh, Kajal, you are from which organization? Uh, I'm from IIT Bombay. I'm doing PhD under Professor Mahomet. So, uh, passive radar. The what happens is that you know the uh, strength of the transmitted beam. Uh, it could be, for example, from a radio station, like as, as I just gave example, BBC or CNN. So, the strength of the beam is not under our control. Okay. As a result of that, what happens is the uh, the, as a result of that, the reflected beam also its uh, strength is not under. Uh, we, we are not. It is not guaranteed what will be the strength, even if it is uh, the target has a particular radar cross section. So as I understand that, because you know, uh, uh, whereas in the case of active radar, what happens? The strength of the transmitted beam, the power of the transmitted beam, is completely under uh, the con our control. Okay. So from that point of view, for a given radar cross section, what I can say is that the radar is, uh, return. Would definitely, in all all probabilities, be higher in the case of active radar than a passive radar. So okay. I don't know. Okay, is that fair enough? You have uh, any other point to discuss? Please feel free. No. no, no, no. Yeah. 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 Anybody else has a question? Okay. If not, then we'll proceed uh, with the uh, next point. Uh, so okay. uh, yeah. before to start, I would like to. Uh, Request our uh, participant from the abroad. If they have any question, they can interact with our professor. Uh, any any participant from the abroad? Okay, so if, yeah, thank you. Thanks, sir. I think there is a no query. Uh, uh, yeah. So let me go through two three slides, and then I will again uh, prompt for interaction. Okay, so. So continuing with this active signature radar, radio detection and uh, ranging, that is uh, to get information on the uh, range, uh, for that means including the altitude, uh, direction and the speed. So this is uh, what is achieved by uh, uh, radar. It is used for detecting, locating uh, and also tracking because once we have information on the range, altitude, direction, then we, uh, tracking is possible. And it operates by listening to echoes of transmitted radiation. That is, echoes are the reflection of the transmitted radiation. And it uses the radio signals. So echo is the electromagnetic energy received after reflection from the object is called the echo or also the scatter. So uh, scatter or echo is the uh, reflection from the object. <clears throat> and these are the different bands and the frequency range. So we start with the lowest frequency in megahertz. It is called the high frequency. And in this table, we end uh, with the V-band and the millimeter wave. So we start with 3 megahertz and end with somewhere around uh, 300 uh, gigahertz. So I think this 300 gigahertz should correspond to a wavelength of about uh, 1 millimeter and above. Is So 1 millimeter and above. Would, uh, would be the range of the wavelengths for the radio waves. And then if the wavelength is going to be below one millimeter, but higher than 0.1 millimeter. So 0.1 millimeter is the end of the infrared spectrum. It is a different thing that it, it will not be like 100 micrometer. Sir, not, yeah, please, please. Sir, sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, slides are not visible. Slides are not visible. Just give me a moment. Just a moment. Sir, slides are visible. We need to pin the slides, then it will be visible. Just give me a moment. Yeah. If you have any such uh, difficulty, please let me know immediately. Now let me just figure out how to how to. Uh, 
take care of it. Just give me a moment. So can you click on the present now? Okay. Which is given in the bar at the bottom. So resume your presentation, right? I click on that. Uh, so click on the presentation. Present now. Present now, which is available in the bar. Uh, okay, presentation is still not seen. Sir, actually, it is a it, uh, it is a scene, but uh, some of the participant uh, is not uh, exactly uh, getting it on the screen. Doctor, sir, let me guide. Sir, actually, what we have did earlier, we have first we have to stop the sharing, and then again we have to start the presentation. Okay. Let me try. Let me try. Yeah. There was a blue option. Stop sharing. Okay, the, it is written. Your your screen is. Uh, it is there on your screen? Somewhere on your screen, it will be there. Okay, turn on. I think when we minimize the this this screen, this okay. picture from screen, I think there will be a stop sharing option. There should be. Okay, let me just try. And there should be. Ah. Okay, I can click on resume presentation and see what happens. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please resume, sir. Please resume the presentation. Also, let me try stop. Uh, stop screen. sharing, sir. Oh. First, click on the stop sharing and uh, again yeah. follow the. Now we have to start present. Uh, we have to do present now. Present now. The photo will arise from the bottom of the screen, sir. When you will uh, move your cursor towards the bottom of the screen, a photo will arise. Okay. There you will find the option. Yes. That's yes, sir. It's okay, sir. Okay. So I guess now all the participants can uh, see the screen, right? Yes, sir. Fine. Great. Great. Okay. So yes, yeah, so this is the uh, uh, table <laughs> which will give the uh, various bands, uh, frequency bands, starting from the lowest frequency to the highest frequency. And what is shown here is just extra information that even the terahertz range uh, is now. Uh, seriously being considered uh, because to design a radar absorbent material for the terahertz range is very difficult. A terahertz range is uh, somewhere between uh, 0.1 to 1 mm and it covers the range 0.3 terahertz to 3 terahertz. So 3 terahertz uh, should be I think 300 gigahertz. So and uh, this is a figure which shows the uh, A range uh, for various radar, starting from the UHF, S band, C band, CX band, and these are the X band and the KU band. They are also used on uh, radars on board an uh, aircraft. So radars on board an aircraft, they need to go for the higher frequency in the gigahertz uh, range where uh, the wavelength is low because. the on board radars the main purpose is tracking and uh, precision is important whereas for surveillance that is vhs surveillance and also surveillance radars the precision is not important uh, information detection is important and range is important higher range is achieved by a uh, higher wavelength higher wavelength lower frequency would mean lower uh, loss in atmosphere lower at attenuation at atmosphere that is the same as uh, higher transmission this is just some uh, some general information regarding the uh, active radar radio detection and ranging uh, any point to discuss on this okay so as i have already mentioned this uh, just to uh, that low frequency high wavelength is used for surveillance and primarily for detection so the bands are vhf uhf and s band whereas the medium frequency are used for tracking that is the c band and uh, x band so and on board radar that is high frequency and short of uh, wavelength uh, are used for also uh, mainly for tracking purpose and on on board radar in the ku k and ka band and on board radar there is also a limitation on the antenna size so antenna size to be small it is important that the 
wavelength also has to be small. So this is the standard radar detection range equation. So the maximum range is the radar detection range is given by all these parameters. So I would like to just touch upon some of the important points. So PR is the radar transmitter power and GR is the gain of the transmitting antenna. It describes how well an antenna converts input power into radio waves headed in a specified direction. So it's the gain of the transmitting antenna. And the, one of the most important parameters in this equation is sigma. Sigma is the radar cross section in meter squared. <coughs> And the aim of radar stealth technology in an aircraft is to minimize or reduce the radar cross section to as low a value as possible. And uh, S by N min is the minimum signal to noise. Noise is, uh, in the case of radar is called the background or the terrain clutter. So uh, as there is a S by N min, it is the minimum signal to noise ratio that is needed for detection. And this S by N min is regardless of the radar cross section value. So it is uh, for detection to take place, the signal to noise ratio has to exceed the minimum. Now from this radar range equation where R max is the radar range, it is seen that the range of a radar is proportional to the one fourth power of the RCS, radar cross section. which would mean that if the uh, radar uh, range has to be reduced by half, then RCS has to be reduced by, I think, uh, six, two raised to four, maybe 16 times, one six. So to achieve 50% reduction in the radar range, the RCS has to be reduced by 16 times, one six times. <clears throat> now this is where we try to you know uh, uh, if possible uh, uh, from point of view of rcs reduction there is one more concept but before that before coming to the burn through range let me just quickly discuss this uh, active radar ecm active radar ecm is the noise jamming radar on board an aircraft noise jamming radar on board an aircraft so in that case we have a competing signal. The competing signal is provided by the jammer and the jammer has a power and this is the equation which will give the uh, power from the jammer. And here this in this equation J by S1 is the minimum value of the jammer to the actual target signal. <clears throat> so this is the minimum uh, J by S min and then we from this equation, we get a burn through range, which is the minimum range below which the jammer is unable to jam the opposite side's radar. So now we have a competing signal from a jammer on board an aircraft. And when we have a competing signal, which is an active radar electronic countermeasure, it is a competing signal that comes on from on onboard aircraft, then we have the concept of burn through range. It is the minimum range below which the jammer is not able to jam the opposite side's radar. <clears throat> now let us compare. So without going into too many details of each and every term, maybe there is not enough time <laughs> to do this analysis. But uh, uh, if we were to take a look at the relation between the burn through range and the radar cross section and the radar range and the radar cross section. As we have seen in this slide, the radar range is proportional to the one fourth power of the radar cross section and the burn through range is proportional to the square root of the radar cross section. So which would mean that RCS reduction is even more effective in the presence of active radar electronic countermeasure using a noise jamming radar on board an aircraft. <clears throat> now the jammer will be effective in the range between burn through range and the radar detection range. So this is the range 
in which the jammer is effective. So we have the burn through range and the upper limit is the radar detection range. So obviously, uh, if the detection range exceeds the radar detection range, certainly we don't need a jammer because anyway, even the radar will not be able to see the aircraft. So that is the upper limit and the lower limit is, uh, the, burn -through, uh, is the burn through range. And both the burn through range and the radar detection range depend on the RCS sigma. <coughs> And uh, by reducing the RCS, by reducing the RCS, the burn through range is reduced, the radar detection range is reduced, but uh, the burn through range reduces at a faster rate than the radar detection range as a re result of which the range in which the jammer is effective, that is the difference between the radar detection range and the burn through range is going to increase with reduction in the RCS. <laughs> So with reduction in the RCS, the range of effectiveness of the jammer on board an aircraft, which is an active electronic countermeasure, the range of effectiveness is going to increase with reduction in RCS. So just as we have active ECM, active electronic countermeasure for radar. So it's a noise jamming radar, which is going to consume power. So that makes it active. We also have passive radar countermeasure and the best example is a shaft or shafts. So in the case of shafts, the target, the aircraft, which is being target, targeted by the radar detector, the target aircraft spreads cloud of thin pieces of aluminum, metallized glass, fiber, which appear as cluster of primary primary targets or floods the radar screen with multiple returns. <laughs> so the best example of passive countermeasure for radar is our shafts. The target aircraft spreads cloud of thin pieces of aluminum, metallized glass fiber, which appear as cluster of primary targets or floods the radar screen with multiple returns. An example of radar ESM, electronic support measure for radar, is RWR, radar warning receiver systems. RWR detect radio emissions and give warning when radar signal is detected. <clears throat> the RWR, their aim is to detect radio emission, which will be from the radar transmitter, and to give the target aircraft warning when the radar signal is detected. An RWR can be installed on all airborne platforms like aircraft helicopters. In fact, most of the military aircraft helicopter, they have RWR installed. Any query so far? Okay. <clears throat> Now, how does this uh, radar stealth, that is RCS reduction help? So to begin with, I briefly cover the concept. There is a concept, the radar horizon. So radar horizon is determined by the distance at which the radar beam rises above Earth's surface. It is determined, the radar horizon is determined by the distance at which radar beam rises above the Earth's surface to make detection at low altitude difficult. <clears throat> so if radar horizon is larger, then detection becomes easier. Now, because uh, radars have a radar horizon with a particular value of radar horizon, then especially aircraft like the previous generation. So current generations are of course fifth generation. So many of the previous generation um, fighter aircraft, uh, their RCS was not that low. And then they were forced to fly at low altitude in order to evade radar detection because of the concept of radar horizon. So it's a different thing that flying at low altitude is also a problem now because of threat, as I mentioned earlier, from MANPACs, the Man Portable Air Defense Systems. So they actually are, uh, you know, uh, for them, detection is much easier for low flying aircraft. 
and low flying helicopter but from point of view of evading radar detection because of a radar having a particular radar horizon um, many of the aircraft with moderate or not that low values of rcs were forced to fly at low altitude so uh, the distance from radar to horizon considering uh, earth and radius of earth uh, and uh, it can be estimated so radar horizon it depends on all these parameters terrain radar height above sea level signal processing this is a, a semi empirical relation and as we discussed that from point of view of evading radar detection all these terminologies became popular for flight map of the earth flight terrain masking flight <coughs> that is use of geographical features like valleys folds in the terrain in order to exploit the radar shadow zone and clutter zone to avoid radar detection so these are certain operational techniques map of the earth flight terrain masking flight that involve use of geographical features like valleys folds in terrain which exploit radar shadow zone and clutter zone to avoid detection radar detection uh, using techniques as we uh, mentioned here in operation now one advantage of radar stealth capability achieved by radar cross section reduction or cs reduction is flight at high altitude because then we need a uh, radar stealth aircraft need not be concerned too much about the radar horizon and low and then the ability to fly at high altitudes is enabled by radar stealth capability by reducing rcs now high altitude flight are better suited for attacking ground targets because high altitude flights are better suited for attacking ground targets because of broader situational awareness and therefore less fatigue to the pilot high altitude flights uh, compared to uh, low altitude flights or terrain masking flights give broader situational awareness of the opposite side and hence give less fatigue to pilot and the main reason is because more amount of uh, uh, area of the opposite side is seen at higher altitudes than at lower altitudes so as a result it gives less fatigue to pilot extend extends the detection range and when uh, uh when uh, let us say uh, <coughs> from point of view of attack uh, it uh, vertical bomb impact higher accuracy is uh, enabled and uh, higher altitude uh, flight uh, require less sophisticated bombs with simpler trajectory because of vertical traject uh, vertical bomb impact and a uh, higher altitude flight enable capability of destroying multiple targets in a single mission and therefore higher altitude flights lead to higher overall cost effectiveness higher altitude flights enabled by radar stealth capability thus give rise to overall cost effectiveness even though there is a cost involved in rcs reduction <clears throat> so these are the points which actually just if uh, strongly justify rcs reduction feature for enabling higher altitude flight and these are the uh, Im uh, important sources of radar returns these sources of radar returns are mentioned from point of view of rcs reduction techniques <coughs> so some of the uh, popular or uh, you know most common let me put it this way the most common radar returns are specular surface return then we have uh, for example uh, other techniques which include uh, cavity return is also very common for example the intakes and as we discussed right in the beginning of the lecture that the uh, intake and the nozzle are based are made s shaped and the aim of the s shape is actually to uh, avoid the inner parts of the aircraft like for example in the case of intake when we have an s shaped intake then the front face of the compressor or the fan in the case of low bypass turbofan engine then the front face of the fan is not seen as an example 
Okay, so here cavity return is one of the common sources of radar return. Then we have several other sources which are also which can also become important depending upon the wavelength, like the traveling wave echo, especially from point of view of the long wavelength as compared to the target dimension, the interaction echo, the curvature discontinuity gap or seam, then creeping wave return, especially for long wavelength, edge diffraction. So all these uh, sources of radar returns are to be noted, especially from point of view of RCS reduction. And RCS reduction now also has to be seen the technique and its modeling and modeling through computational electromagnetics from point of view of RCS reduction. And yeah. Any query so far? OK, if not, we'll go to the next. <clears throat> Now, just a quick look at the uh, radar. Uh, so, just as we have ground base, we can also have airborne radar, with, like airborne early warning and uh, control system, A, W, and C system, now also popularly known as AVAX, airborne warning and control system. So, this is just an illustration taken from Wikipedia. So, the aim is to detect aircraft, ships, and vehicles at long ranges for command and control of battle space by directing fighter and attack aircraft strikes for surveillance, for example, over ground troops. So surveillance from the sky over ground troops and frequently perform a command control battle management function similar to ATC, air traffic control. And when used at higher altitude, radar on aircraft allows operators to detect and track targets and distinguish between friend and foe aircraft much farther away than similar ground-based radar. So this is one of the advantages of AVAX. Radar on uh, in the sky allows operators to detect and track targets and distinguish between friend and foe at much far farther away distance as compared to ground-based radar, <clears throat> but can be detected uh, yeah, by opposing forces like ground-based radar but is much less vulnerable to counterattack due to its mobility. <clears throat> now, here I may just mention that uh, uh, another, so from point of view of the tactical disadvantage, while radar definitely has the advantage of from point of view of ranging, the radar detection ranges are, are quite large, as, as hundreds of kilometers. But there are two disadvantages that firstly, they give a warning. As we discussed, RWRs are installed almost on all a military aircraft, military helicopter, that is the radar warning receiver is installed on almost all military aircraft, military uh, helicopter. So that is one tactical disadvantage that use of radar immediately gives the warning to the target aircraft and the other tactical disadvantage of aircraft that whether it is a ground based radar or a sky based airborne radar, the radars can be detected by the opposite side okay, using and then once they are detected, then it is always possible to launch anti-radiation missile in the direction of the transmitted beam to destroy the radar, at least the transmitter, assuming that the transmitter and receiver are not at the same place. Uh, uh, okay, if they're at the same place, of course, it is a monostatic. Okay, uh, without going into those details, so that at least the transmitter can be destroyed by anti-radiation missile. <clears throat> now, destroying the radar transmitter by anti-radiation missile, which is designed to detect and home in on the direction of the opposite side's radio emission source. <clears throat> now, this is possible for ground destroying ground-based radar, also destroying uh, airborne radar. But in the case of airborne radar, for example, a radar on board an aircraft like in an AVAX, the advantage is because of its mobility. Okay, so. Uh, AVAX, that is airborne radar, is much less vulnerable to counterattack by anti-radiation missile uh, because of the mobility. Now, regarding the anti-radiation missile, uh, just to clarify that they are designed for use against enemy radar, though jammers and radios used for communication can also be targeted. It's just a clarification that they are actually designed for destroying the opposite side's radar, at least the transmitter, assuming transmitter and receiver are not at the same location. 
but jammers and uh, radios used for communication can also be targeted by anti radiation missile and anti radiation missile always will continue to pose a threat uh, to uh, transmit uh, to radar transmitter any query okay so most anti radiation missiles uh, designs are intended for use against ground based radars okay <clears throat> and the aim of these anti radiation missiles is to degrade the enemy air defenses in the first period of uh, conflict so that the survivability is enhanced for the following waves of strike aircraft the aim of the anti radiation missile is to degrade enemy air defenses in the first period of conflict by destroying the transmitter of the radar so in most surveillance radars the uh, radars uh, are monostatic so the receiver is also located at the same place so the aim of the anti radiation missile is to increase the survivability for the following waves of strike aircraft and the other advantage of using Uh, anti radiation missile is also to shut down unexpected surface to air missile sites in air raid because these surface to air missiles are used for uh, destroying the aircraft used in air raid <clears throat> so the point here is that these uh, anti radiation missiles uh, do pose a threat to radar uh, and this point is to be noted as one of the uh, Uh, a tactical uh, let us say issue in using a radar <clears throat> now uh, coming to now the more uh, slightly more precise understanding of radar cross section so radar cross section is the cross sectional area of a perfectly reflecting sphere radar cross section is cross sectional area of a perfectly reflecting sphere it is the area of an imaginary perfect reflector that would reflect the same amount of energy back to the receiving radar antenna as reflected by the actual target radar cross section is the area in meter square of an imaginary perfect reflector that would reflect the same amount of energy back to the receiving radar antenna as reflected by the actual target now it so happens that the perfect reflector which we have to imagine is its geometry has to be a sphere because a sphere has a characteristic that uh, the reflection would be independent of the incident direction so therefore the radar cross section is actually the uh, projected area of the sphere so it is the area of the uh, and projection projected area of a sphere is a circle so only difference is uh, because aircraft geometry uh, uh, as aircraft as viewed by the uh, transmitted by the uh, by the beam that in, uh, that paints the radar would significantly depend on the viewing aspect so which would mean that the radar cross section is a very strong function of the viewing aspect <clears throat> so rcs describes the reflective strength of the object in the direction of the radar system it describes the reflective strength of the object the target in the direction of the radar system denoted by usually denoted by sigma and with uh, si units meter square <clears throat> now uh, just a few disclaimers the rcs does not necessarily bear a direct relationship with actual physical cross sectional area of the target the rcs does not necessarily have a direct relationship with the actual physical cross sectional area of the object but depends on other several other factors so it is an effective area that an effective area of the target that intercepts the transmitted radar power and then scatters that power isotropically back to radar receiver so it is an effective area that intercepts the transmitted radar power and then scatters that power 
isotropically back to the radar receiver. This is how the radar cross section is to be interpreted. And this interpretation of the radar cross section will actually uh, tell what are the techniques for radar cross section reduction. <clears throat> So obviously, there are from this interpretation, there are two very simple ways from point of view of the concept, from the concept to minimize the scatter. That is the same as minimizing the reflection. That means if uh, reflection is to be minimized, then absorption we try to maximize. That is one way. Or the other way is that we try to transmit. That is uh, uh, absorption is one way and it goes through and it will go through. Uh, like, for example, in the case of radar transparent material and many of the composite materials are known to be radar transparent. Many composite materials are known to be radar transparent. I may just mention a small <coughs> uh, uh, point that the combination of uh, composite radar transmitter and radar reflector, that means it should not happen that it transmits and then it impinges on a radar reflector like a metal as an example that combination again can be uh, can, uh, is unsuitable okay. anyway this is just these are just some detailed clarification the idea was just to drive home the concept yeah, any query okay i may just mention that estimation of radar cross section for uh, actual aircraft actual helicopter including the rotor blades of the main rotor, the tail rotor, in the case of aircraft, the wings and the, let us say, the cavities associated with the uh, intake, associated with the nozzle. <clears throat> so estimation of the radar cross-section is a significant uh, computational exercise coming under computational electromagnetics. Apart from the geometry, the other very important parameter is the wavelength. The wavelength is important or rather the wavelength relative to the target dimension is important, the ratio, because the ratio wavelength and the target dimension will decide which of the regimes, the Rayleigh resonant or the optical regime uh, is, the, is where the in interaction lies. <coughs> so we'll briefly discuss those points. Okay. <coughs> So RCS uh, by now, I think based on the discussion is, uh, is a function of the sh shape, the size, the target dimension to the wavelength, shape, size, and the target dimension to the wavelength. So, and as we have seen from the radar range equation, radar range is proportional to the one fourth power of RCS. The resultant RCS is a vectorial sum. Vectorial sum would mean I may just clarify that if phase matters when it comes to vectorial sum, the phase matters. And a phase, which would mean that if there is a phase mismatch, phase mis mis mismatch, which means that if let us say there is a vectorial sum in which uh, there is uh, waves at 180 degrees out of phase are interacting, then there is also a possibility of cancellation. And this cancellation is actually the basic principle of some of the radar absorbent material, which later on I have a slide on the Salisbury screen as an example. Okay. So here actually the, at this stage, the point is the resultant radar cross section is the vectorial sum of all the returns on the target, including retro reflections. Retro reflections would mean that the incident wave bounces at several surfaces of the target and eventually comes out. Are, are examples of retro reflections. <clears throat> now, RCS may lie in one of the three regions depending on the ratio target dimension to wavelength. So, Rayleigh resonant optical, Rayleigh wavelength much larger than the target dimension. So, for a given target dimension, particularly the low frequency high wavelength radar. So, in this region, the RCS varies smoothly with lambda. And, uh, and here the RCS is pro inversely proportional to the fourth power of wavelength. And the RCS is proportional to the volume squared, size matters. So in the Rayleigh region, RCS is inversely proportional to the fourth power of wavelength and directly proportional to the volume squared. So the target size matters in the Rayleigh region. 
now resonant region is in between in which the wavelength and the target dimensions are comparable and rapid changes in the rcs are likely to occur in this resonant region rapid changes in rcs are likely to occur in this resonant region due to interactions between various scattering mechanisms and then we have the other extreme uh, because the other extreme uh, is uh, important because most radar operate in this region in which the wavelength is much smaller than the <coughs> target dimension so optical means it behave, it behaves more like the visible light <coughs> uh, what we popularly know in optics so in this region the uh, rcs varies smoothly with the wavelength in the optical region rcs varies smoothly with the wavelength yeah any question any point to interact on yes any question so uh, so yeah yeah please uh so my name is bharat so i want to know uh, about more about the retro reflection sir so uh, uh, okay retro reflection is actually uh, the easiest way is from point of view of multiple reflections so uh, what is going to happen is that it is always possible that there is a bouncing of the incident wave and eventually it will come out okay uh, is that fine so uh, that means it's a part of the stealth technology sir no it is uh, uh, because what happens is that uh, uh, resultant rcs is a vectorial sum of all returns so uh, it need not just be uh, a direct return a direct return is for example specular surface return so this is a direct return in a, uh, so in addition to a direct return a specular type we can also have in which before returning there can be uh, bounces on the target itself okay sir thank you sir yeah. any other query hello sir yeah please sir. my name is deepak kumar uh, yeah. my question is this. how to estimate accuracy of rcs measurement uh, uh, okay so uh, here you know first i wish to mention that actually i don't do research on rcs i do research on ir signature that is uh, so i am uh, actually that is the first thing Now, accuracy of RCS measurement. So, what I can basically tell is that you know, while uh, yeah, hello, yes, video camera pen change. Ganesh, please uh, mute your device. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, this so uh, this information actually I should say I am not very comfortable. I am myself not very sure. In fact, RCS measurements can uh, it is not necessary to do field measurements. it is also possible to do rcs measurements also in an uh, anechoic chamber so uh, this actually information i have maybe of uh, some 5 6 years back when i visited a, a defense lab somewhere you know i happened to see that anechoic chamber meant for rcs measurements that is how i got that information that uh, while field measurements are always possible uh, but then uh, you know it is also possible in a lab also in a laboratory also So from point of view of accuracy of the uh, measurements you know and then how this accuracy compares with computational electromagnetics that information i don't have actually but what i can do is that you know i'll keep your question in mind uh, whenever i meet any defense scientist you know i'll try to get academic unclassified information on this is that fine okay sir okay any other query uh, dinesh uh, uh, may i ask you about your organization please all the okay. lords kindly uh, Give you a brief introduction to the expert. Uh, you name it, organization, please. Hello. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sir, actually, I'm Dr. Jinnath from uh, BSSUT, Burla, Odisha. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Please, I'm I'm listening. Yes. Yes, sir. Actually, I, I have some questions, sir. Actually, sir, about this uh, RCS. Sir, is RCS depends upon the nature of the materials, whatever we are using, actually. Uh, yes definitely in fact uh, uh, a slide is about to come but i at the moment i'm not very sure uh, because in the time table i saw that this presentation is scheduled to end at 12:15 but let me tell you right now itself 
for example, uh, ba the basic principle of uh, radar camouflage is uh, impedance matching. So okay. impedance of the material should be the same as impedance of free space or impedance of air. I think the impedance of air is almost the same as impedance of uh, free space because that okay. ratio of the radar return divided by the radar transmitted at the, in the numerator, we have the impedance mismatch. Impedance mismatch is the difference in the impedance of the target and uh, the impedance of the free space. Okay, so an impedance of the target. So if we want to reduce, so either we have a radar absorbent material or a, or, or a very bad conductor of electricity because the basic principle is that uh, uh, most of the electrical conductors, they will generate a surface current. The surface current is responsible for the reflection of the radar. So material plays a very important role and... Uh, okay, sir, most of the people in them Hello. Uh, hello, I'm listening, sir. Hello. Yes, I'm sir. listening. Actually, now, uh, okay. Sir, actually, now the work is actually, uh, since I'm also working with some microwave absorbing material, sir, we are now preparing actually that, uh, our, uh, that um, yeah, RAM uh, from the waste material. But uh, many things have I found, they are also uh, combined with the part actually some ceramic material. So, can we make it some bioceramic material for this application of the reduction of RCS? Uh, okay, now I will tell you the information, uh, the unclassified uh, information, scientific information which I have regarding this radar absorbent material, though I do not uh, do research in radar absorbent materials myself. So, and particularly because I'm uh, basically an aerospace engineer, I'm more interested in radar absorbent material for aerospace applications, for yeah. application to aircraft. Okay? Okay. And uh, for application to aircraft uh, in, or helicopter, uh, the most important is weight minimization, weight reduction. <clears throat> yeah. Sir, so, uh, can you get here for the all detailed information for, uh, for my further for, for, for query, sir, please, uh, can you, share, sir, can you share, share me your entire address, sir? Uh, sorry, what do you want? Sorry? Well, I need your for the entire uh, contact uh, details so that uh, I, I guess in the future I can contact you, sir. Uh, dear Ganesh, uh, the, all the details of the expert are available on his website. Okay, so, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, you only have to search on IDB, uh, Aerospace Department, all the details of Professor even though the search profile is already Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir. So, maybe I can, uh, my email address is spm at ero, and uh, so that is my email address. So you can contact me anytime. But uh, again, yeah. So, again. Uh, uh, of course, you can just verify the uh, alphabets, you know, yeah. Please, so, the, again, yeah. Sir, again, sir. So, uh, S SPM at AERO. SPM at AERO.IIT.AC.IN. SPM AERO. Yeah. If something is not clear, you can kindly verify on the website as uh, somebody okay. said. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Fine. So, and, or maybe later on, you can call me on my mobile. I will spell out each and every alphabet. Anyway, now coming to your uh, question. Okay. So, uh, firstly, weight minimization is very important. Now, uh, what I know is that there are ferrite-based radar absorbent materials and polymer-based. Okay? So, ferrite-based, these are the two potential candidates for uh, radar absorbent material. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the term is called lossy dielectric. Lossy dielectric, I think so. And, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, it is, uh, uh, yeah, so, and then we also have the Salisbury screen. And uh, now, because of weight consideration, the polymer-based polymer-based uh, radar absorbent materials are, I think, uh, gaining priority over the uh, uh, ferrite-based. Uh, so, ferrite-based and including, for example, the concept of Salisbury screen, which is there in the next slide, they not only uh, they tend to be very thick and very heavy also because uh, if they are, if you want to achieve, if you want to achieve. Uh, radars cross section reduction for a wide range of wavelengths for a wide range of wavelengths including the uh, long wavelengths long wavelengths means low frequencies low frequencies are uh, used for surveillance so to achieve radar uh, cross section radar reduction especially for long wavelengths used for surveillance you need to use a salisbury screen which would be very thick and with more thickness comes more weight that is the so this weight consideration. I think there is a shift towards polymer base, but I don't have precise information because I don't do research myself. Yeah, is that fine? Any other query? 
Okay, if no other query, then I will just uh, quickly go through the RCS reduction. RCS reduction depends on the mission and how much cost is justified uh, because RCS reduction, uh, the cost of the mission, its effectiveness and mission profile. And uh, there are two techniques like uh, uh, the shaping and RCS material. So shaping uh, using a compact smooth blend, what is used in B2. B2 uses a compact smooth blend and a faceted uh, that is flat panels configuration uh, as used in F117. And uh, th these are the basic guidelines, uh, no protuberances or gaps, highly swept wing leading edges. So the main aim is to minimize the backscatter because from point of view of shaping, the basic idea is that the radar is monostatic. Monostatic would mean transmitter and receiver are at the same location. So what is more important is that the reflection should not take place in the same direction as the transmission. So uh, reflection taking place in the same direction as transmission is called backscatter. So backscatter is to be minimized and uh, minimizing backscatter uh, would mean encouraging forward scatter. So forward scatter, how do we encourage by shaping? So the the point regarding shaping is it works mainly from point of view of a monostatic radar. Shaping generally works from point of view of a monostatic radar. But the moment we go for bi-static, that means the transmitter and uh, receiver are at different location, or we go in for a radar network, which means there is one transmitter and several receivers. And even in bi-static, there is no guarantee where the uh, receiver is located. Then in that case, the shaping as a technique for RCS reduction may not work. So the other <coughs> uh, general guidelines are buried engines. So as for example, using S-shaped intake, S-shaped exhaust, and intake and exhaust located over the upper surfaces of wings, as an example. So intake and exhaust located over upper surface of wings, I think this is what is used in B2. Okay. Then in that case, it will take care of uh, the ground-based radars because then, because intake, uh, uh, and exhaust, they actually form excellent sources for cavity returns. So, in cavity, we ha actually have multiple reflections. So, if intake and exhaust are located over the upper surface of wings, then in that case, uh, it takes care of ground based uh, radars. But of course, if, uh, if it is an AVAX, then we cannot guarantee that this technique will work. <clears throat> and S shaped inlet duct and S-shaped nozzle for screening of air intake. Now, <coughs> any uh, signature reduction feature, including RCS reduction feature, will come up with penalties. And the penalties include reduction in aerodynamic performance, like, for example, especially in f 117 <coughs> So if you take a look at the uh, photo, which is available even on, uh, on Google search, then you will realize that it's uh, now, in fact, uh, these were the first uh, stealth aircraft, F-117 and B-2. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, both these aircraft were actually uh, meant uh, for subsonic or at, at the most high subsonic. And even though they are uh, subsonic, but they actually had uh, highly swept leading uh, edges of wings. Now, highly swept uh, wing leading edges are actually used in supersonic aircraft, not subsonic aircraft. But this highly swept leading edge was from point of view of forward scattering and not backward scattering. So obviously, so certainly, if highly swept leading edges are used in subsonic aircraft, then the aerodynamic performance is going to come down. <clears throat> so this is one example of uh, RCS reduction penalty. Aerodynamic performance comes down. Many of the radar absorbent material would be heavy, the weight goes up, and because of the uh, performance coming down, the range will come down, the payload carrying capacity will come down if the weight goes up, then, the, uh, then many of these uh, RCS reduction features like radar absorbent material, including uh, especially there is a maintenance involved, maintenance goes up, maintenance cost goes up. And even the initial uh, investment or maybe the material cost and the cost of the aircraft goes up. So these are some examples of uh, RCS reduction penalties.
yeah any point uh, to discuss or any point to add no then we'll go to the next slide now these are the factors influencing rcs the target uh, factors like the target material target geometry that is the all include the size relative to the wavelength it also includes the absolute size and also the shape of the target <clears throat> then target material so metals are strongly radar reflective metals like aluminum for example most of the metals are strongly radar reflective because most metals are good conductors of electricity <clears throat> so in contrast uh, non metals like wood cloth uh, plastic fiber glass they are much less reflective and some of the composites are radar transparent <clears throat> so in addition <clears throat> factors influencing influencing rcs include the incident and reflected angle so the incident angle depends on shape of target and its orientation to radar source the incident angle depends on shape of target and its orientation to radar source and the reflected angle depends on incident angle and normal direction at incident surface the reflected angle depends on the incident angle and normal direction at the incident surface <clears throat> the radar absorbent paint radar absorbent material uh, most of them they convert the incident uh, radar energy received into heat so most radar absorbent material or paints they absorb the radar energy and convert it into heat so as i briefly uh, mentioned regarding the shaping <coughs> shaping of the uh, aircraft geometry from point of view of reducing the rcs shaping and orientation it is mainly from point of view of monostatic radar monostatic radar is one in which transmitter and receiver are at the same location in a monostatic radar transmitter receiver are at the same location and best example is surfaces of f117 they are flat and angled so radar will be incident at large angle to the surface normal that will be reflected that will reflect at high reflected angle that is it will be forward scattered so the geometry the surface geometry of f117a which is a stealth fighter it is also used as stealth bomber it is flat and it is angled so as a result of which the incident radar will be at large angle relative to the surface normal which will reflect at high reflected angle that is it encourages forward scatter and minimizes backward scatter from point of view of monostatic radar <clears throat> then the edges are sharp and not rounded okay as rounded surface often have some portion of the surface normal to the incident radar so any ray incident along the normal will reflect back along the normal and we get strong reflected back scatter signal if it is rounded so this is the reason why edges are sharp and not rounded because rounded surface will often have some portion of surface normal to the incident radar and any incident ray along the normal will reflect back along the normal and we get a strong tendency for back scatter reflection of the signal in the case of rounded edges that is the reason why edges are sharpened for stealth aircraft and not rounded for stealth aircraft now <clears throat> some of the points to be noted that even these uh, RC, low rcs tell their craft mainly from point of view of let us say the uh, frontal aspect from the side aspect these aircraft can have much larger rcs than from the frontal aspect and the rear aspect so some of these uh, aircraft uh, stealth aircraft from the side aspect and for uh, okay they can have a much larger rcs than from the frontal and the rear aspect sometimes the rcs even in the rear aspect can be higher than in the frontal aspect so uh, uh, most of the stealth aircraft they are designed at, 
mainly to reduce RCS from the frontal aspect. And then the rear aspect, but from the side aspect, they can have a large RCS. And this, what I'm referring to is from, from point of view of shaping consideration. <clears throat> and uh, some practical examples from point of view of smooth surfaces. Now, indentations act as corner reflectors, which increase RCS from many orientations. Indentations, they increase RCS from many orientations because they act as corner reflectors. And uh, then these bomb bays, engine intakes, ordnance pylons, uh, joints between sections, they all have to be eliminated. And that is the reason why uh, many of these fifth generation uh, stealth aircraft, uh, in fact, the, <coughs> uh, the ammunition, including the air-to-air -air missiles or the drop tanks, they are not located generally outside. So they are generally uh, located inside and then the uh, 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 bomb bay door opens and then uh, uh, the, the armor, uh, then the ammunition is, uh, is used, uh, the, the, for example, the air-to-air -air missile. But that also comes with problems because then when the, uh, when the door opens, when the bay door opens, then at that moment, the, during the time interval, in which this bay door opens, then in that case, the RCS can significantly increase because then we have a cavity. <clears throat> and then there is also a possibility, uh, there, are, uh, there is also one issue that when this bay door opens in flight, then firstly, significant moment is generated, aerodynamic moment is generated. And many a times, uh, there is also a possibility that the door may not uh, close back. That is also possible. So when this uh, uh, ammunition door opens, there is a possibility uh, if it, uh, that it may not close back. And if it doesn't close back, then it creates a problem that then the RCS goes up because we have a cavity. So in the uh, next generation, that is the sixth generation stealth aircraft, which are still on the drawing board. At the moment, I'm not very sure about the information about the sixth generation stealth aircraft, which are still on the, which I guess are on the drawing board. but there will be some additional considerations and whatever is the perception of this uh, stealth from point of view of radar might uh, undergo some transformation, but at the moment, I don't want to discuss at least in this introductory lecture. So any questions so far, any point to discuss, any point to add? So may I know how much time I have with me now? Because it is already 12:20, so uh, how, uh, maybe if the if the organizers can kindly confirm how much time do I have? Uh, sir, the time that we have set for the session that is actually over. Then we oh, can extend this session for 12:30, uh, and then we can go for the lecture session. Uh, okay, so if I have, so can I have something like another five minutes time more? I will try to wind up. So we can extend this session up to uh, twelve thirty, if you want. Uh, okay, then uh, I will uh, take another ten minutes more, up to twelve thirty. Yes, sir. Okay, and then of course you know we can always have uh, the participants. You're most welcome to call me even on my cell, like if you wish. Uh, so after the lecture, we can uh, take uh, another ten minutes for the. Uh, Query session and uh, yes, uh, then yeah, yeah, for the yeah. Query session. Yeah. yeah, I'll just take a one minute break and I'll come back after 10 minutes. Okay. Fine. Okay, let's continue now. Okay. Now, <coughs> this is regarding, uh, you know, the intake, uh, the inlet. So, uh, this is uh, the use of S shaped inlet duct. S shaped inlet duct. So, in, firstly, intake is an upper rear center of aircraft. So because the intake is in the rear center of the aircraft, uh, we need an S-shaped uh, inlet. And the same is true with exhaust and engine, which are at the uh, rear of uh, aircraft. So the exhaust system uh, can also be S-shaped. So this is actually a photo which has been taken from the uh, neck S-duct engine air intake, uh, S-duct engine air intake, which conceals the engine from probing radar waves, S-duct engine air intake, which conceals the engine from probing radar waves. This uh, photo is available on the net. 
Now, uh, now regarding the radar absorbent material, because as we discussed in the previous slide, shaping has its own limitation. Shaping has its own limitation. Uh, it works mainly for, uh, from point of view of monostatic radar and uh, maybe uh, it gives only from a, a certain green aspects, but radar, so this is where the radar absorbent material can help if uh, it can be made uh, light in weight, then they can be applied. Light in weight is one point and they should work if possible over, over a wide range of wavelength bands. <clears throat> So there are two considerations with respect to radar absorbent material that uh, firstly they should be light in weight and second thing is that they should <coughs> they should uh, be effective over a wide range of wavelength bands now these two requirements can actually be contradictory contradictory means if you try to make them applicable over a wide range of wavelength bands, especially the low frequency and long wavelength bands then in that case that thickness and weight can increase so uh, basically, uh, there are two principles, attenuation and uh, attenuating RAM and resonant attenuating RAM. <coughs> in attenuating RAM, uh, rapidly absorbs some part of incident radiation by admitting it and internally attenuating incident signal by converting into heat. Uh, so one material which is used for energy dissipation is carbon, as an example. So attenuating RAM rapidly absorbs some part of incident radiation by admitting inside and internally attenuating incident signal by converting into heat and resonant ram internally generates reflections that interfere with the main reflection from surface resonant ram it internally generates reflections and these internally generated reflections will interfere with main reflection from uh, the surface <coughs> So RCS reduction by materials, that is radar absorbent materials. So, so using lossy dielectrics. So here the basic idea is to absorb and dissipate. So in lossy dielectric, the basic concept is absorb and dissipate and and composites, which the, uh, the basic concept is uh, they are radar transparent. Uh, several composite materials are radar transparent. As I mentioned, we just have to avoid the combination composite followed by metal. The, we need to avoid the combination uh, composite followed by metal. <coughs> so the <coughs> concept is uh, we try to minimize this ratio. This ratio is the intensities of reflected signal to incident signal is given as the difference in impedance divided by the sum of the impedances. So in the numerator, we have the difference in impedance. So the material impedance and ZA is the impedance of free space or air, which is more or less a constant at 377 ohms. So if we use a material uh, whose impedance matches with that of free space, then in that case, this ratio will be very small and it will reduce the intensity of the reflected signal by reducing this ratio difference in the impedance divided by the sum of the impedance. Now, most of the radar absorbent material, they are effective in these frequency bands, 2 to 18 gigahertz. And this uh, frequency band of 2 to 18 gigahertz will cover the uh, wavelength band one, around 1.7 centimeters to 15 centimeters. Now, this frequency band of 2 to 18 gigahertz, it corresponds to S band, C band, X band, and K band radars. <clears throat> and actually, you know, though it is very convenient to discuss radar in terms of frequencies and IR in terms of wavelength and micron, I purposefully converted the frequency range 2 to 18 into wavelength, that is 1.7 to 15 centimeter, <clears throat> because this wavelength <coughs> gives an idea it gives an idea as to what kind of thickness of the radar absorbent material is required. <clears throat> Especially if we use a Salisbury screen, then its thickness as a thumb rule is lambda by 4. So the thickness of the radar absorbent material is the basic principle is Salisbury screen. The thickness is lambda by 4. <clears throat> so these wavelengths actually give a direct indication of what kind of thickness <clears throat> of the radar absorbent material is required and which gives an indication of the weight of the radar absorbent material. 
<clears throat> now this would mean now why we have this rain now because of these uh, wavelengths and the associated thicknesses it now follows that radar absorbent material will actually be ineffective either in both the extremes very long wavelengths and very short wavelengths so most of the radar absorbent materials are ineffective in very long wavelengths that is the l band uhf ultra high frequency and a uh, very high frequency so these are actually the low frequency or the uh, long wavelength bands and they will also be ineffective in the k ka v and millimeter and the gigahertz range so even for very low wavelengths the radar absorbent material will be ineffective so in one case very thick radar absorbent materials are required and in this case the thickness comes down to such low values that they become ineffective and in this case the amount of radar absorbent material thickness required would go up significantly and the weight will come in between if we try to <clears throat> design radar absorbent material especially for the long wavelength or the low frequency band which is the high frequency very high frequency uhf and l bands so <clears throat> let me just check the time okay i think now we just have about 3 minutes to uh, 12:30 and since uh, 12:30 has been defined as the limit uh, for the presentation i think i we can take we can actually uh, stop this uh, lecture and uh, of course uh, there is some uh, uh, this this is actually a full semester course in uh, in my department so uh, you know uh, in fact uh, Uh, if, uh, especially students, uh, especially participants who would like to pursue their PhD or masters in my department are welcome uh, to apply and go through this course. And maybe we we will find some other opportunity sometime in the future to maybe uh, when maybe some more uh, lectures are possible. I may just say that you know all this uh, uh, stealth technology, whether it is uh, based on RCS reduction, infrared signature reduction. acoustic signal reduction there is significant scope for computations also okay so uh, with this actually i will uh, end my uh, lecture and uh, maybe with the uh, i will just take a one or two minutes break and i will come back to uh, answer the uh, queries uh, of the participants and participants are also welcome to add to what i said also to correct some of the ambig ambiguous statements i made uh, if they have more information or better conceptual understanding uh, all con participants are welcome to add and correct what i said so all that we will do after a short 2 3 minutes break is that okay yes sir it's okay sir okay fine so i will just go and come in 2 minutes okay okay, okay.
Sir, for joining me. So, uh, if, if there is any question, anybody would like to add something, you are most welcome. Our dear participants, uh, we would like to request you if you have any query, you can directly direct with the expert. Okay. So, there is, yeah, uh, please, even if you would like to add, somebody would like to add something or would like to clarify something, also feel free. If somebody would like to uh, share the feedback of this session with the expert, then they are also invited. Okay, no question. Uh, no, no question. In anything, any point to interact on? Okay, if not, then uh, uh, okay, then in the, yeah, in, 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 can I have something? Can I, yeah. Uh, may, I know, may I know what is the role of uh, these meta materials in stealth technology? Uh, we may know uh, your uh, organization. Uh, I am Dr. Ramesh Gupta from Shivnagar University. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining. Uh, Meta uh, materials. I have. Uh, well, uh, I have no idea actually. Uh, what from point of view of stealth technology, what I can say is the the concept. So, so from point of view of radar, we use a radar absorbent material or a radar transparent material. From point of view of infrared, we try to use optimum emissivity paints of co uh, coatings. Now, uh, I don't have the information on specific materials, including meta materials. I don't have that information, but your question is very much valid, and you know I appreciate the question. I will keep it in mind. Uh, whenever I visit some uh, laboratory, I will ask this question regarding materials, uh, meta materials, and I will try to get back to you. Because I have one more friend in your university He called me one week back. I, I I'll tell you his name later. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So, so I have one more friend. I will. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Fine. Okay. Okay. Any other query? Any other point? Any other query? Uh, any person? Hello, sir. Or? Yes, yes. Please, please. Hello, sir. Yeah, hello. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, I'm please Deepak Pushti from SIT Dhankanal. Hello, sir. Yeah, hello. I'm just audible. Me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Tell yeah. me about. Yes, yeah, sir. Tell me about uh, more detail about flight and uh, data recorder. Flight data recorder. It's a uh, uh, time. It is a uh, flight data recorder. Actually, you know, I at the moment I don't have the information regarding flight data recorder. I think it is a, uh, a device for, for recording all the parameters. So that is what I vaguely remember. I had studied that for maybe about 25 years back when I was doing my undergraduate from the department. But I forgot all the flight data recorder right now. As, from what I remember, it is used for recording. Right information like altitude, speed, Mach number, uh, all that is recorded uh, for the flight duration. That is what I remember. Sir, I know uh, about uh, duration. What uh, duration it uh, uh, store? In uh, uh, hello, sir. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm listening. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, your question is about flight data recorder, but uh, I don't have. I, I will do one thing. I will find out the information. And I will uh, uh, tell this whenever because one of the organizers, I every week at, or at least once in two weeks, I talk to him. He's actually my very uh, close friend. I will inform that information on flight data recorder to one of the organizers of this uh, uh, short term course. At the moment, I don't have information. Yeah. Any other query? Okay. If there is uh, no query, uh, yeah. So uh, I assume there is no further query. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Before to conclude the session. Uh, no, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, to take the question for this session. Any participant would like to interact with the expert? They can interact. Uh, so I hope that there's a no further queries. Okay. So then. I now I request to Dr. Davesh uh, uh, for the to, for to commence the valedictory ceremony. Okay. Yeah. Okay then. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. So we request you to uh, be as a chief guest for the valedictory ceremony. It will only hardly take five minutes, sir. No. Uh, uh, okay. Fine. Actually, I think you know maybe. Uh, okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Satin. Uh, okay, I welcome uh, all to this valedictory session of this short term course on multi scale uh, computational field dynamics, fundamental and applications. Uh, I'd like to inform that uh, Professor S.P. Mohalika is also the guest of honor for this valedictory session. Uh, your presence is indeed a source of great motivation, sir. Uh, over the past few days, we have had deep insight into several applications of CFD and of course their fundamentals also. We were focused on how to how this CFD works in different 
in different applications through the uh, valuable and informative lectures delivered by eminent uh, professors or the speakers from the different IITs. Like on the very first day after the inaugural sessions, we have uh, we, uh, we had a lecture by Professor Atul Sharma from IIT Bombay. We delivered the lectures on the fundamentals of the computational fluid dynamics. And then in the second session, we had a lecture by Professor Sandeep Saha, uh, again from IIT Bombay. We discussed about the application of the computational fluid dynamics in a phase change material. And on the second day, we had uh, a lecture by Professor K. Murlidhar from IIT Kanpur. And we had the two lectures from the Professor K. Murlidhar uh, that was based on the fundamentals of computational fluid dynamics. And then on the same day, uh, for the second session, we had a uh, lecture from Ratnesh Tukla, Professor Ratnesh Tukla from IASC, Bangalore. Uh, the lectures uh, was related to the multi-phase flow and fluid structure interaction. Then on the third day we have discussed the uh, uh, we had a lecture from Professor Suman Chakravarti from IIT Kharagpur. We have discussed about the phase change method uh, with the help of C. And then on the same day on the second session we have discussed the Professor uh, by, uh, we had a lecture by Professor Rajesh Bhardwas. Uh, well, that was based on the CFD in interfacial flows. Then on the fourth day, we have uh, we had a lecture by Professor Krishnakant Agarwal. We had a two lecture uh, from Professor Krishnakant Agarwal based on the combustion and their experimental validation. And then on the second session, we had uh, the lectures from uh, Professor Om Prakas Singh from IIT Dinichu. Uh, he had discussed so many things uh, along with the practical applications by by providing the ideas uh, to machines and so many things. And also he has discussed uh, on the, the application of the CFD uh, in solar systems. And then uh, today we have the lecture by our guest of honor of this validatory session, Professor S. P. Mohalikar sir. From IIT Bombay, he has discussed a lot about the steel technology and their related applications in the aircraft aircraft technologies. Sir, that uh, your session was very informative, sir. Uh, so I would like to thank you for this session. Now I request uh, Professor S. P. Molika, sir, if he want to address our participants. To give a brief uh, address to our participants, if you want. <coughs> so, uh, actually, uh, I will only say that uh, you know uh, for, for this workshop has been uh, extremely uh, useful, and uh, all the credit goes to the or uh, to all the organizers of this uh, of this uh, short term course. And uh, this short term course is uh, definitely uh, useful, uh, useful from point of view of the. Uh, use of CFD and also from the basics behind the uh, CFD and maybe uh, I think it is important to take forward this uh, uh, short term course uh, it's uh, 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 the le lecture that were delivered on different aspects of CFD and I may just recommend that all the participants may consider doing research uh, you on CFD also and using CFD also. And uh, with this, I think, you know, I will hand over back to the uh, organizers and uh, uh, give all the organizers of this uh, short term course deserve uh, uh, credit for uh, or, uh, organizing uh, this uh, very useful uh, course uh, in the middle of uh, the current situation. And this is something which uh, uh, is uh, uh, an, a very good cause for a very, for a very noble cause. The highest level of social service has been done by the organizers in uh, spreading the knowledge information concepts basics on cfd and its application yeah uh, now i give it back to the organizers yeah thank you sir thank you for your work sir. Uh, now i would like to announce uh, here related to this sort of course that uh, the e-certificate uh, will be provided to all the participants their attendance has already been recorded and also, uh, we will provide a feedback form, a Google form, 
where you have to give your feedbacks about this uh, sort of course. And you need to be very careful during the giving of the feedback form because your e certificate will be based to, on the information which you will provide in the feedback. Uh, information is the related to your identity, like the names. Okay? So you have to be very uh, careful during the filling of the feedback form. Uh, now, uh, but uh, that uh, feedback form will be separately provided to you. But here, for this validity se uh, session, uh, we would like to welcome uh, your feedback. If you have any, if someone want to share your feedback with us regarding to this sort of course, then I would really like to welcome that feedback. So, if you have, uh, if you have any uh, views to share with us, then please. Anyone, if you, hello, participants, anyone of you who want to share your feedback or your views, your thoughts with us? Hello. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Jayesh, I am Dr. Yes. Asok Mishra. Yes, 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 sir. Please. Yeah. So, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, sorry, my uh, due to network, I could not join in a middle while some half an hour. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Our, our resource person, Professor Sipa uh, P. Moholika, and all uh, my friends who are the, who are the participants. I call them my friends actually. And uh, very to be very frank, I am from Centurion University of Technology Management, Odisha. And I am uh, serving as a professor in the Department of Mathematics. Am I, uh, am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course. Yeah. So my field is basically fluid dynamics. And as you know, we have been, uh, I completed my PhD in 2003 from Barampur University. And I have been continuing my research work uh, with fluid dynamics, with numerical analysis, and um, with the two phase flow, nano fluids, everything. But generally, we deal with the theoretical aspects. I never, uh, I have never focused on CFD, computational fluid dynamics. And I, I was just wondering, what is CFD? And people say that, sir, why are you not applying uh, to industrial fluids, this one, that one? And because, as you know, even my friends might be here, you may agree with me, as we are uh, from the general universities and mathematics we are doing, I went on searching different organizations in India, not only India, abroad also, to establish a relationship to learn CFD. But hardly I could find any institution in India and abroad, mathematics particularly. I discussed with my mathematicians in IIT, um, our uh, rookie also IIT, uh, ISM Dhanbad, Kharagpur. I could not find any professor from fluid dance department who are dealing with CFD, computational fluid dynamics. They used to do research work uh, they focus on theoretical aspects. Even foreign consul, like Professor O.D. McKinney, most of them might have heard of that one. They also do like that. But then I sourced what to do. Then I focused, first I uh, discussed with Professor Radhakan Padip, ISA Bangalore, and Professor Balakrishnan from ISA Bangalore, who are doing uh, CFD uh, on um, air aerospace. I contacted what is CFD. Then I, I, I came to know that mostly CFD is being dealt by Mechanical department and aerospace sciences, aerospace department. Most of the uh, um, institutions in India and institutional report in India, not in India, abroad also. I could find, I went to, uh, uh, we can say, uh, Cranfield University, let us say, is good at CFD. So I, I just last, it is a progress of last six months, my friends. It's not beyond that. So I could understand that this is being dealt by and taught by only mechanical department or aerospace department, not mathematical department. Then last three, three to four months, uh, I, I, my two friends are there. Uh, one professor, uh, Mukunji Pandey, our university, he is good at uh, ANSYS student, also good at uh, different uh, CMN software as, as Simulia. And another is my scholar, also my colleague, Professor Sujit Mishra, from mechanical department. Both are from mechanical department. I met them, my teacher. Now I have been learning last three months and for information in our university, the Department of Mathematics and Mechanical Engineering both and on behalf of total university, we are floating a domain course of 24 credits, 20 credits, okay, which contains 
introduction to CFD, then uh, grid generation, flow solver using Simulia, application of CFD using Simulia, and then students will do projects. 20 credits domain we have floated in the month of June, and there are 18 students, mathematics and mechanical engineering, they are now completing. And today I completed their class also like that. So we could form this domain course. I have never seen in any other departments or in, so first time we are floating that one. Then I took interest. Now I am learning uh, using Simulia what to do. Then I started I had to learn such things. Then first time I could find, I must thank to Master, uh, Dr. Duesh Kumar and also Satya, uh, Satyendra Singh and all the people those are involved. First time I could um, uh, join this kind of FDP really from CFD. I, was, I have been wondering where is that? And next time I have. Uh, uh, so I am going to join also in month of first week of October. It is maybe Autal. Some uh, AI city is conducting Autal. So that was joining. So I was wondering for that one. So first time, I must thank uh, all the professors from this NIT who has conducted this type of uh, the, uh, FDP. And uh, and you might have understood. I am not beating my drum before you because I am more anxious to learn this one. So every session, except three four sessions. Uh, I have asked many, I raised many questions, doubts, and through this FDP, I could learn the basic things. I have some idea about the theoretical aspects, but hardly as having some uh, uh, idea about the practical aspects or those are industry approach. So through this FDP, particularly, I, I, I have been benefited. So I must thank all the resource persons, all the organizers, from the core of my heart. Honestly, I'm speaking, not just I'm not delivering dialogue or something like that. I really have understood 10 to 15 percent. I have learned the, I gained the knowledge. And yesterday, internal FDP was there. We applied there also like that. So I thank the team from core by my heart, correcting such type of FDP uh, or SPVSP for um, uh, online. And also, see, uh, earlier what is happening, pandemic, I must also thank pandemic. Otherwise, if pandemic would not, would not have been there, then if NIT or IIT would have been conducted this type of uh, um, FDP or something like that, we had to move to that place. So we might have moved or not, I don't know. But because of pandemic, it is online. So I think that not only me, my friends also might have gained the knowledge through this FDP. So I request, also I invite all the organizers to conduct such type of uh, uh, CFD particularly. I like because of this one. Like that, let it be conducted at least twice in a year so that advanced uh, topics should be taught properly. And also I invite some industrial applications. Yesterday, how Professor Om Prakash uh, Singh conducted things like that. Some different industrial applications also should be there um, using some flow solvers. If, if that will be there also, we could learn more, um, like learn more on those topics. So I highly grateful to all the members, all the organizers, again, all the um, resource persons for getting the benefit. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shokra Misra, for your views and for your words of praise. We really appreciate your feedback. Uh, if anyone there who would like to share your uh, feedback, then uh, uh, hello, good afternoon, sir. I am Nirmal Kumar. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I also raised many questions about uh, CFD because I am also highly interested in uh, this field. Uh, when I took admission in my B uh, 2016, I highly interested in computational fluid dynamics. So I am uh, done in B in mechanical engineering, and now I am uh, doing currently I taken admission in M Tech uh, CFD in uh, UPS University because in India only pure CFD is available there only. I search uh, all colleges all of, around the uh, world. It is available only in Cranfield University in uh, uh, London and in India only in UPS University. So that's why not done preparation of yet uh, because uh, I want in that position only. In uh, this workshop I learned many things and especially I thank to uh, uh, Om Prakash Sarji, he taught uh, real things and he taught uh, what is the difference between academia and industrial uh, CFD. He, he, say, he already said that in academia it is totally, dif uh, totally uh, different environment and in industrial it is totally different environment. So I once again thank to Om Prakash sir and I, uh, I 
uh, and i also thank to uh, nit jalandhar to conduct this such uh, type of uh, workshop uh, and we gather uh, some other in, uh, different inform information and now i am currently i am uh, studying uh, cfd only and uh, my interest to, in doing uh, phd in cfd so i i am currently searching a lot of colleges universities but it is not available uh, available in uh, india only it is uh, available i think so in france so i i think so i can go to france for my phd program oh, thank you thank, thank you sir thank you thank you uh, dr devesh can you hear me yes 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 i can hear uh so uh, i would like to uh, include that uh, because this uh, uh, session and all 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 of your session was being uh, included the students and the professors also so maybe we could have included uh, some of uh, hands on experience on some of the softwares which could create more interest for the upcoming students because most of the upcoming students don't have that good hands on experience on the uh, softwares so if we could have given a little more uh, in depth or uh, hands on experience on the software like ansys or any other hypermesh i think that could have created a more interest and uh, more uh, more students could have got inclined towards the cfd so but uh, till now i think uh, the session was very good i also learned a lot from your session and uh, congratulations to all the organizers for organizing this uh, session thank you thank you thank you mr ramanda for your words i am for your kind information that initially we had planned to give some hand on uh, hand on experience along mm -hmm. with the lectures but uh, actually the problem arises the, uh, in this online that uh, how to tackle with the online that's the main problem then we talk to prakash sir to deliver if you have some class uh, type of material so that uh, it will see it will give a feel like a hands on experience then we mm -hmm. have included this actually on, uh, online it will, it will be quite difficult actually because everyone um, it is difficult to find everyone at the ens software actually that's the main problem or how to go even small uh, small exp, uh, small small uh, Simulation. If it will be offline, then it will be good. Otherwise, mm -hmm. handling online will be. Will be yeah, I think it will really make cause problem to some students, or it will be okay. helpful to some other. That will be the problem with this uh, online actually. Offline it is possible. Mm -hmm. But here in this pandemic, we are not able to organize this offline. Initially, we had uh, uh, planned to do offline, but due to this, we had shift this offline HTC to the e HTC. That's the problem actually. Okay, and now uh, if there is anyone, otherwise I will uh, we will move ahead because we are running late. Our guest of honor uh, has some meeting. Sir, can I say something? So yeah, of course. Of course. Sir, I am Toki Rama Choudhury. I am yeah, from. Be very brief. We are running. Uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Okay. I'm Tokyo Ramesh Choudhury. I'm uh, from Chittagong University of Engineering and Technology. It's in Bangladesh. So, <clears throat> my professor, uh, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Prasenjit Das, he advised me to do this course because actually CFD is something that I was very interested in. Uh, right from the uh, first, uh, I was interested in the fluid mechanics course. and after doing the fluid mechanics course i told my supervisor that i'm very interested to do my uh, thesis in cfd so he advised me to join this course and i'm very glad to say that i attended each and every session and uh, every session was insightful and i learned a lot from all the great professors and maybe i'm uh, uh, juniors among all the attendees here Uh, but still uh, it uh, gives me a great pleasure that i am attending these classes and learning from the great minds of india so a big thanks to all the organizers thank you sir okay.
Okay, I, I I remember the day uh, when we, the coordinators, the organizing committee of this short term course, we started planning to organize such type of uh, e -short, e -e 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 short term course. Initially, it was short term course that was the offline, but due to pandemic, we saved this short term course to e -e 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 short term course. Uh, we, after uh, we started planning to organize such type of studies, after seeing the need of the computational fluid dynamics and their applications in different uh, technical fields, after doing so many uh, thoughts, uh, uh, we got the approval to, uh, from the authorities to do or to organize such uh, type of uh, uh, short term course. After that, uh, we got the speakers and then we got the participants. And this uh, number of participants, which we have got, not from not only from the India but uh, from the entire world, we, we have got that really motivated us. And here I, I can see in the chat box that uh, participants are request, requesting to do such type of conferences in the future. So here I would like to mention that we have really motivated with the numbers of participants that we have got and we will definitely try to do this type of short term course in the future, in the coming futures. Uh, but uh, after doing all this effort uh, from the initial to this day, this day when we had to say uh, bye to all our partakers. But uh, before this, I would like to thank uh, uh, to our all the partakers. Uh, here, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank our of course, our, uh, our director sir, who has given uh, uh, motivations and platform and all the authorities and he has done all the, the requires which we need to organize such type of uh, STC. So thank you, thank you to our working director, Professor L.K. Vrasthi sir, and, 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 and director Mekhi Jalandhar. Now, I'd like to uh, express our gratitude to the take you third NIT Jalandhar, who has given the financial hand to organize such type of uh, uh, term course for free of course to our participants. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, thought NIT Jalandhar. Now, of course, I would like to thank our eminent speakers from the different IITs uh, who has uh, who took time out, the time out of their busy schedule and showered us their tales of uh, uh, wisdom and knowledge. So, thank you to all of our speakers. Now, I'd like to thank our head of the department, Mechanical Engineering, who has given their hands of support at all the states and all the time, and who has motivated us, and all the time he motivated us to do such type of work. So, thank you, sir. Thank you for providing such type of opportunity. And now, I would like to thank all the faculties of the institute, as well as our department, who have involved directly or indirectly in this e short term course. And of course, we would like to thank this Google Meet who have given this platform in these pandemic situations where we can organize such type of conference and we can meet and we can interact with the eminent speakers, speakers from the different institutes, not from the India, but from the throughout the world. So thank you, thank you, the Google. Now I would like uh, further, let's have a special recognition to all the participants who remained present throughout and encouraged the moral of, uh, of our speakers by their enthusiasm. Thank you so much for being our support all the time, dear participants. Thank you. Now, with this, uh, with this, I would like to conclude this, this short term course. Uh, on multi scale computational fluid dynamics, fundamental and applications. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to Professor S.P. Mohalikar, sir, to be our guest of honor for this validatory sessions. 
thank you once again to all of you with this i am concluding this e sotron course have a one uh, have a wonderful and fun filled days ahead thank you to all